My name is Jason Miller, and this happened to me on October 12, 2003. I was working as a CIA field agent and have been for over 15 years. Sometimes, you just know, even before a mission starts, something isn't going to go right. This was one of those times. It wasn't unusual for me to be assigned a mission on short notice, but my gut told me this one would be different. I work within a very small specialized division of the CIA. We focus on cases no other division wants to touch. We aren't a large division, less than 25 of us. My partner on this mission was Ben Harris. He's an ex-military guy who joined the agency about two years ago. The mission details were brief. Investigate some unusual sightings in Big Cypress National Preserve, Florida. Locals whispered about strange lights, a creature unlike anything they'd ever seen, and a number of unexplained disappearances. We were given a file containing a handful of incident reports detailing missing hunters and the occasional lost hiker. Nothing overtly unusual. It sounded like another wild goose chase for our division, and I was starting to see why the other teams shied away from our cases. We flew into Miami the next day. From the moment we landed, the humidity made every breath feel like I was swimming through soup. After picking up our ride, we headed directly to Collier County to meet up with the local sheriff, Sheriff Dwayne Carter. He was a gruff-looking man with a face that seemed etched by the sun and a set of suspicious eyes. The meeting was quick. Sheriff Carter was a man of few words. He seemed more relieved than eager to pass the case over to us. His men had done a cursory search of the preserve, but had turned up nothing. There were whispers, though. Among the deputies, there was talk the missing persons weren't just lost in the swamp but snatched by something that lurked in the shadows. Something unnatural. Carter dismissed these stories as local lore, but I could tell, even behind his hardened exterior, there was a glint of something in his eyes that might have been fear. We decided to camp out near the outskirts of the preserve. The sun dipped low, painting the sky with streaks of red and orange as we set up our tents. The swamp pulsed with its own nocturnal rhythm, buzzing with insects and the echoing calls of hidden wildlife. Ben joked about how it felt like we'd stepped onto the set of some low-budget horror movie, the kind you'd find at 2 a.m. on cable TV. I didn't laugh back. That night, I dreamt of dark shadows twisting between the cypress trees, of eyes gleaming with an alien hunger. When dawn broke... I was restless, a cold sweat clinging to my skin. Ben noticed, of course. Rough night? he asked. I just muttered a reply, not in the mood for his easygoing banter. Something didn't sit right, something I couldn't define. We spent our first day familiarizing ourselves with the landscape. It was brutal. The air hung thick and heavy. The swamp seemed to stretch on endlessly, a dense tangle of trees, sawgrass, and murky water. Ben tried to make small talk, but I found myself constantly on edge, scanning the tree line for any sign of movement. It took a while, but eventually we found the general location described in the incident reports. Nothing appeared unusual. It was simply a section of the preserve like any other. We meticulously surveyed the area and meticulously documented the terrain, searching for anything out of the ordinary, any evidence to validate the local rumors. Even after hours of painstaking examination, we found nothing. No tracks, no markings, nothing to suggest anyone had been here at all, let alone anything unnatural. Ben suggested we retreat to camp for the night. I was eager to agree. My unease was growing, and the sun was already sinking below the horizon. As we turned to leave, I heard a noise. A rustling, like large branches being disturbed behind us. 
We spun around, our hands reaching for our weapons in a synchronized motion. The air hung heavy with silence. Then we heard it again, only closer this time. A low growl, echoing through the trees. I flicked on my flashlight, but its beams seemed to be swallowed by the thick vegetation. Ben did the same. Whatever it is, it's big, he whispered nervously. Then we saw it. Two eyes. Reflecting the beams of our flashlights, glinting in unnatural yellow in the murky twilight. The shape behind them was massive, hunched. Its skin is that what I was seeing? Seemed rough, almost scaled. Something moved through the swamp water, creating a ripple of disturbance toward us. For a moment, we were frozen. I felt a surge of pure, primal fear course through my veins. I knew with unwavering certainty this was no bear or alligator. Instinctively I raised my gun, but before I could fire, the creature melted back into the swamp foliage as quickly as it had appeared. Did you see that? Ben asked, his voice shaky. I nodded, unable to speak. We stood there for a long time, listening. But the only sounds were the buzzing of insects and the rhythmic croak of frogs, mockingly normal against the pounding of our hearts. When we were sure whatever it was had moved on, we slowly retreated to our camp. Neither of us slept much that night. We stayed close to the fire, taking turns keeping watch, our senses on high alert. The shadows seemed to writhe with movement, every rustle a potential threat. Despite our exhaustion, sleep was a luxury we couldn't afford. In the morning, we radioed headquarters. We described the creature as best we could, our reports intentionally measured, devoid of the terror we had both felt. The response we received was cryptic. We were to maintain our position and wait for further instructions. Hours passed. All was quiet. Too quiet. The sense of being watched, of being hunted, not at me. I'm going to scout ahead, I told Ben. He looked like he wanted to protest, but thought better of it. Be careful, he said. I slipped into the trees, gun drawn, acutely aware of my vulnerability. The humidity clung to my skin like a second layer. My footsteps felt too loud, every snap of a twig a possible betrayal of my location. I hadn't ventured far when I saw traces of a disturbance. Crushed sawgrass, overturned earth, drag marks heading toward a pond-like opening. My breath hitched in my throat and I crept closer to the water's edge. Blood, dark and fresh, smeared across the muddy bank in a thick trail. A cold realization hit me. The missing persons, the rumors weren't just local lore. That creature, it wasn't just sighting them, it was taking them. I scanned the surrounding trees, but there was no movement, no sign of yellow eyes. Sweat stung my eyes, mingling with the insect repellent that was doing little to deter the buzzing horde around me. My radio crackled. Ben's voice, urgent and panicked, came through. Jason! Get back to camp now! I took off running. The shots came out of nowhere, echoing through the dense vegetation. It sounded like a high-powered rifle, something the locals wouldn't have. When I stumbled back into camp, it was a scene of chaos. Three figures darted in the shadows, dressed in combat gear. They were moving fast, working together. One of them carried Ben, unconscious, slung over his shoulder like a sack of feed. I shouted, raising my gun, but another figure appeared behind me, cold steel pressed against my temple. A swift blow to the head sent me reeling into darkness. When I regained consciousness, my head pounded with a rhythm that matched the panicked beat of my heart. My hands were bound painfully behind me. Fear surged through me, but I fought to control it, 
focusing on assessing my situation. I was in a small, windowless room. The floor was concrete, stained and damp. A single naked bulb cast a harsh, yellow light, creating long, grotesque shadows that seemed to dance on the walls. Ben was tied in a chair opposite me, still unconscious, a trickle of blood running from his hairline. The only other furniture was a metal table bolted to the floor. Our captors were nowhere to be seen. Ben? Ben, wake up! I spoke urgently, trying in vain to rouse him. Each movement felt strained, the ropes cutting into my wrists. He groaned, blinking open his eyes. There was confusion for a moment before it was replaced by stark realization. He struggled against his bindings, but it was useless. Who were they? I asked. No answer was needed. They weren't locals, weren't park rangers, weren't anything easily explained. They were professionals. Someone had known we were coming. The door creaked open. One of the men walked in, his features obscured by the shadows. His movements were fluid, predatory, and I had the gut-wrenching feeling I was no longer the hunter. Your bosses don't know where you are, do they? His voice was deep, with an accent I couldn't place. Russian, perhaps. We sent a check-in, I said, keeping my voice steady. It was a lie, a desperate bluff. In our line of work, sometimes the only play was to buy time. He chuckled, a dry, humorless sound. You think those reports reach Langley? Don't be naive. The people you work for, they sent you here on a fool's errand. I narrowed my eyes. There was a truth in his words, an echo of my own suspicions. This mission had felt off from the start. Like someone was playing a long game, and Ben and our pawns they were happy to sacrifice. What do you want? Ben asked, his voice strained. The creature... The man replied with chilling simplicity. There's no. I started to protest, but he cut me off. Don't play the fool. There is something out there. You saw it, felt it. We want it. My gut twisted at his words. They knew all along. The mission, the sightings, they were bait. Someone had wanted us in these swamps. But why? The creature, it's dangerous, I said. Potentially valuable, the man corrected. The right kind of dangerous can be tamed, turned into a weapon. No, his voice turned harsh. You're going to take us to it. Hours passed in a blur of pain and fear. They untied us but kept us under constant watch. They were playing with us, cat and mouse, a confidence I knew they had every right to feel. There were five of them in total, all armed, all with an air of military efficiency. They fed us, rationed us water. We were, essentially, prisoners. When darkness swallowed the swamp once again, they led us, bound once more, out into the night. Using night vision goggles, they moved with an unsettling ease through the terrain our flashlights feeling clumsy in comparison. Deeper into the swamp we went, the sense of something waiting ahead growing stronger with every step. Ben whispered to me, fear lacing his every word. Do you think we can outrun them? I shook my head. It was futile. Escape wasn't an option, not while they could track us with such ease. We were walking straight into a trap, our trap. The creature was waiting for us. It materialized from the shadows like a monstrous apparition. In the pale moonlight I saw it in chilling detail. Its eyes, pools of sulfur yellow, reflected the terror back at me. Its body was a hulking mass of sinewy muscle and scales rough as tree bark. Claws, long and curved, dripped with something dark and viscous in the moonlight. Without warning, it launched itself at our captors. 
The ensuing chaos defied logic. The disciplined team fragmented in the face of the creature's onslaught. Gunfire ripped through the night air, punctuated by screams as the creature tore through the men with horrifying efficiency. Blood splattered everything, blurring my vision. We were no longer prisoners. We were prey, just like the rest of them. Ben and I hit the ground, instinct taking over as we desperately crawled through the undergrowth, trying to escape the carnage. I don't know how long we ran. Time ceased to exist, reduced to the pounding of our hearts and the rasping of panicked breaths. Finally, we collapsed behind a twisted old cypress, our bodies trembling from exertion and terror. The swamp had fallen silent. Cautiously, I raised my head. The only sounds were the mournful calls of some distant night creature and the faint lapping of water against the shoreline. I looked back at Ben. His eyes were wide, filled with a terrible understanding. Somehow we had survived. We made our way back to the road just as the sky started to lighten. I hailed down the first passing car, the driver staring at us with a mixture of pity and horror. We told them there'd been an accident, that we needed help. They alerted the authorities. When Sheriff Carter arrived, we gave him a carefully constructed story. An ambush, unidentified assailants. There was no mention of the creature, no way to describe the impossible horror we had witnessed. Carter looked skeptical, but there was a hint of awe in his eyes, too. He'd heard the rumors, seen the fear in his men. Maybe a part of him believed. They never found the bodies, what was left of them. The incident was classified, swept under the rug by nameless officials. I resigned from the CIA shortly after. Ben did, too. We tried to put it all behind us, to start new lives. But some shadows cling. The aftermath is one of sleepless nights and relentless questions. There were rumors within the agency, whispers that the creature is still out there, or that there are more like it. And I worry, sometimes, that it's only a matter of time before they find us again. I see the creature in my dreams, its yellow eyes, its blood-soaked maw. It waits for me, a lurking reminder of the darkness we encountered, of the things that hide in the shadows, of the narrow line we walk between the known and the unknown. My name's Alex Tanner, and this happened to me in 2012. I work solo mostly. Agency gives me assignments, drops me in the middle of nowhere, then lets me find my own way back. My marriage didn't survive the lifestyle. Ex-wife thinks I'm an accountant, which may be safer for everyone in the long run. This mission started with whispers. Rumors of people vanishing in a remote corner of Utah Canyon country. Not tourists, mind you. Locals. Old-timers who knew the back trails. Folks assumed they'd just gotten lost, until some of their remains turned up. Now, remains out in the wilderness aren't that unusual. Accidents happen. Animal attacks, sure. But these... They showed a kind of violence beyond cougars or wolves. The reports had me puzzled. Messy. Overkill, but with a strange precision. The locals were spooked, talking of something monstrous, something not natural. That's where I come in. The canyons were a maze of red rock and shadows when I set out. Hiked in under cover of darkness, set up camp in a hidden gully place gives me the creeps, to be honest. A stillness, unnatural for the desert. Even the insects seem subdued. Spent two days watching, waiting. Third night it happened. Near full moon. I dozed off and woke to a prickling at the back of my neck. Movement in the darkness. Slow. 
purposeful. My night vision's decent. I saw the silhouette against the skyline. Thing was huge, loping on two legs with an awkward grace. Too elongated to be human. Too controlled to be an animal. There was intelligence in its movements, a chilling sort of focus. The next moments are a blur. I grabbed my rifle, not sure if it'd work against this, but something was better than nothing. It saw me then. It let out a hissing wail and lunged. I fired two shots, and it didn't even slow. I scrambled back, gun clattering from my grip, and tripped on a rock. The thing was on me in a flash. It had hands, long-fingered and tipped with what looked like claws. One slashed across my chest. Pain exploded, white and blinding. I managed to grab my backup pistol and fired point-blank. The creature screeched and stumbled back, giving me space to roll away. I glimpsed the damage I'd done, holes in its torso leaking some kind of black, oily fluid. Yet it still moved, still stared at me with those burning eyes. There was no winning this fight. I turned and ran, fumbling through the darkness. I heard it crashing after me, but the canyons were a labyrinth. I sprinted, dodged, stumbled for what felt like hours. Sweat stung my eyes, blood pounded in my ears. Had to keep running. Had to survive. Finally, I risked a glance back. Nothing. I slumped to the ground, lungs aching, chest throbbing. That's when I heard the whimpering. A young woman was huddled a few yards away, staring at me with wide, frightened eyes. She was trembling, covered in dirt and scratches. I thought, I thought it had. She swallowed, voice hoarse. Been running for days. Turns out her name was Sarah, local hiker who'd ventured too far off the trail. The creature had snatched her three nights ago. Somehow, she'd kept ahead of it, kept hidden. That takes guts I can barely fathom. Getting out of there was another hell. Dawn was breaking, and that meant danger. The creature, it didn't like the light. We took our chances, picked our way out of the canyons, found a ranger station. Made up a story about a wild bear. They don't need to know the truth. Neither does anyone else. The agency patched me up, asked their usual questions. I gave them half-truths, enough to keep them satisfied without revealing the scale of the thing out there. Sarah vanished. Smart move. Best to make a fresh start after something like that. I've healed, mostly. The scars itch sometimes. Remind me. There are dark corners of this world where the maps end where things that shouldn't exist still lurk and hunt. The agency wants me on another assignment. Up in Alaska this time. I've got no choice, really. Out there, the monsters have different names, different forms. But that hunger in the darkness, that's always the same. My name's Jack Walker, and this happened to me in 1998. I was a bit of a hotshot back then, fresh out of Quantico. Thought I knew it all. My wife, bless her heart, had finally put her foot down, so I was on an enforced camping trip with the kids. A week in the wilderness to reconnect with nature, or some such nonsense. We picked a remote spot in the main woods up near the Canadian border. Found a pristine lake, perfect for a dad trying to impress his ten-year-old daughter and grumpy teenage son. The first few days were rough, too many bugs, not enough Wi-Fi, and frankly, I was already yearning for a decent burger. But the look on my daughter's face when she caught her first fish? Worth everything. Then came the fourth night. A change in the air. 
thick stillness settled over the campsite. My son, Ryan, had gone for an evening walk said he was getting cabin fever. When he didn't return by sunset, I started to worry. By full dark, I was getting seriously antsy. Took the flashlight and went searching, calling his name. Emily stayed by the fire, holding it together while I was losing my damn mind. Hours passed, no luck. Just those woods closing in, that too quiet silence. Finally, a noise broke through the night. It wasn't Ryan. It was a scream, raw and chilling. My blood ran cold. I sprinted toward the sound, flashlight slicing through the darkness. Then I saw him. Ryan was thrashing, pinned down in the undergrowth, something monstrous on top of him. I couldn't get a good look in the dim light, but it was big. Huge. Unnaturally tall and thin, with limbs that bent in the wrong direction. Its face was blank, smooth except for a gaping maw full of jagged teeth. In that moment, pure instinct took over. I dropped the flashlight and charged forward, screaming like a madman. I grabbed a branch and swung wildly, trying to drive the creature off. It hissed, a sound like escaping steam and turned those empty eyes on me. Ryan scrambled free. He was bleeding. Bad. But alive. I shouted for him to run. The creature lunged, but the branch caught its shoulder, slowing it just enough. We sprinted back toward the campsite, hearing those inhuman snarls right behind us. My lungs burned, but I thought only of getting back to Emily, protecting her. Just when I could see the flickering firelight, a hand snatched my leg in an unbreakable grip. I tumbled hard to the ground, dragged a few feet. Ryan was yelling for me. In the half-light, I saw that hand again, skeletal, fingers too long. Emily was suddenly there. She'd grabbed the axe for splitting firewood. With a desperate cry, she swung, the blade catching the creature's wrist. A spray of something black splattered around us. It screeched, recoiling, that severed hand still clutching my ankle. We scrambled away and reached the campfire. I ripped off my shirt and used it to make a tourniquet for Ryan's leg. Emily sobbed against my shoulder. Then we heard it, a rustling from the woods. It was circling us, wounded, but still out there. We huddled by the fire, that trusty axe now our only defense against the darkness. There was no question of sleep. We just waited, prayed, and tried to keep the fire burning strong. Every crackle from the shadows was pure terror. Come sunrise, the thing was gone. We packed everything into the truck and drove like hell for the nearest town. Ryan had to have surgery, but he made it. Doc said he was lucky to be alive. We didn't give the real story, of course. Too crazy, nobody would believe it. Claimed it was a bear attack, though everyone seemed a little skeptical considering the wounds Ryan had. They sent a park ranger to investigate our campsite. Never found sign of that creature. Some locals muttered about skinwalkers, old legends of the native tribes. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised at this point. Never took my family camping again. To this day, I get cold sweats thinking of those glowing eyes in the dark, the feel of that too strong grip on my ankle. My kids, they never talk about it. Sometimes, I think it's better that way. Sometimes, it feels like we left a piece of ourselves out there in those haunted woods, a piece that can never quite find its way home. My name's Marcus Pierce, and this happened to me in 2009. You won't find me in any official handbook, understand? My section deals with unconventional threats, 
the kind that can't be explained away. Before this, I was a hotshot field agent, the cocky James Bond type. This assignment, it took that right out of me. Our intel led us to the Ozarks. Seemed a group of hikers had gone missing, not an unusual occurrence, until the remains of one turned up. The body. I'd been in Fallujah, but this was pure nightmare. Like someone had turned him inside out. Local PD was baffled, of course. That's where we step in. My partner, Jenna, and I posed as forest service reps. Locals weren't too chatty. Found whispers of old legends, something they called the haint, a thing of the woods. Figured it was superstitious nonsense. But out there, alone at night, you start to doubt everything you know. Second weekend, Jenna went out on a solo recon mission. Should have gone with her, but I had the intel to sift through, and arrogance can be as deadly as any weapon. She was supposed to radio in every two hours. She didn't. I waited until dawn, then took the jeep out to search. Found it abandoned at the edge of the woods. No sign of her. Radio was dead. I called in backup, but protocol demanded a waiting period, red tape and all that. That was my second mistake. I went in alone. Stupid move, maybe, but I wasn't about to sit and wait. Should have been smart, but I was driven by fear, the guilt gnawing at me. The woods were different that day, thicker somehow. Shadows seemed to shift on their own. That's when I saw it. Not the whole thing, mind you. Just an arm, impossibly long and skeletal, reaching out from behind a tree trunk. Too thin, too many joints, not human. I kept my cool, retreated slowly. Heard branches snapping further in, as if it was circling me. I found Jenna's pack by a stream, ripped open. Inside, her camera... I hesitated, then played back the footage from the night before. Her voice, shaky. Rustling noises. Then in the darkness, those eyes. Two glowing orbs in a misshapen shadow of a head. Jenna screaming. Then the thing lunged, and the camera went dark. I didn't think. I just ran. Tripped over exposed roots, scrambled up, kept running heart pounding like a war drum. It was behind me, gaining, breaking branches with its unnatural strength. The noise, that clicking, rasping sound. It was toying with me, I knew. Hunting for sport. I reached a clearing, and there was an abandoned cabin. Burst in, found a rifle in the corner. Not an ideal weapon against this. Whatever it was, but it was something. The thing didn't rush in. It watched from the tree lean. I could feel those eyes boring into me, predatory intelligence within them. I waited, rifle clutched wideuckle tight. Hours passed. Sun started to dip. Maybe it was done with the game, ready to finish me off. Then came the rustling from the undergrowth. It was flanking me. I fired a shot out the window, shattering the glass. The creature hissed in surprise and darted away, affording me a better look, tall, emaciated, skin stretched tight over bone like worn leather, and that clicking rasping sound, it was coming from its weirdly jointed legs. I had wounds to tend and supplies to gather, but I knew I couldn't rest yet. That thing would be back. I scanned the cabin and found an old map of the surrounding area. There was a logging road a few miles out that might connect with the trailhead. Just a sliver of hope, but the sun was setting and it was that or waiting to die in the dark. I made it out under the cover of twilight, found the road, and walked through the night. Kept imagining those clicking legs in pursuit, the toothy silhouette against the moon. I must have looked half mad by the time I reached a ranger station. Spilled out my story, 
begged for help. They thought I was delusional, concussed, probably on drugs. Except, they took one look at my shredded clothes, saw the fear in my eyes, and they sent out a search party anyway. Didn't find a trace of Jenna. As for the creature, official report says bear attack, but I know the truth. I've seen the thing that lives behind the curtain of the natural world. And it saw me. They gave me a psych eval, two weeks of mandatory leave, and then, back to the office. My boss, let's call him Carter, sat me down. Tried the friendly act at first, but his eyes were cold. Made it clear they'd swept the whole thing under the rug, that wild animal attacks don't inspire investor confidence. But there was a glint in Carter's eye too, a hungry curiosity. He knew I wasn't lying. He knew there was something more out there. That's when the other offer started. Not field ops, no more gunfights with cartels. Labs, research facilities, all off the books. Analyzing things the regular scientists couldn't explain. Things brought in from dark corners of the globe, and sometimes from right here in the good old U.S. of A. I took the deals. Figured it was the only way to maybe understand, maybe find some trace of Jenna. Besides, sitting in a gray cubicle wasn't going to cut it after, after the Ozarks. The years became a blur. Weird artifacts, half decayed tissue samples from God knows where, and rumors. Whispers in hushed hallways of other facilities, other creatures like the haint. Sometimes I even found myself hoping for a mission, some tangible threat, instead of this creeping dread that seeped into my bones. Then came the call about Alaska. A remote Inuit village, disappearances and those same damn glowing eyes reported in the darkness. Carter put me on a plane the next morning. This time, I was the expert. I arrived to a community gripped by terror. Their stories eerily echoed the Ozark whispers. The hunters who vanished, the creature they called the Shadow Walker, the guttural cries echoing through the tundra. We set up camp, a mix of agents and hand-picked locals. Nights were spent scanning the desolate landscape, waiting for anything. Locals got jumpy with every creak of the ice. I felt it too, the prickling on the nape of my neck, the unshakable sense that we weren't alone. Then, the blizzard hit. A wall of howling white. Our tech was useless. We were holed up in flimsy tents, cut off from the world. That's when the screaming started. One of the villagers dragged kicking from his shelter. We found him torn apart a hundred yards away, surrounded by tracks that made no sense. They looked like clawed hands, but far too big, too widely spaced. We hunkered down, every rustle of the wind setting us on edge. And me. I knew there was only one way this would end. It was like I was back in those woods, pray, waiting for the inevitable. It came in the final hours of the storm, a monstrous shape lumbering through the swirling snow. I caught glimpses, the impossibly long limbs, the hunched, elongated torso, and those eyes burning through the wideout. Panic fractured the group. Gunshots rang out, barely more than firecrackers against that thing. It rushed, and two agents went down in a flurry of torn limbs and guttural snarls. I was rooted to the spot, a flashback to Jenna's camera footage. But this time, something snapped inside me. It wasn't duty or training, just raw fury. I charged the creature, my own scream merging with the storm. I remember grabbing its leg, pulling it down. Muscle and sinew felt like old rope beneath my grip. Its claws raked my side. I aimed my gun and fired point-blank into its torso. The creature howled, a sound of pain and shock, and thrashed. I lost my grip and was flung back, slamming into the snowdrift. 
The last thing I saw as I blacked out was its silhouette retreating into the swirling whiteness. I woke up in a hospital bed, bandaged up, with a hell of a story they didn't believe. Said I must have been attacked by a polar bear, suffered head trauma in the blizzard. Carter was there, all smiles, offering me a desk job where it was. Safe. I looked him dead in the eye and told him exactly where he could shove that desk. I walked out, bought a used pickup and drove south, no plan, just away. Still see those damn eyes in my dreams, hear the clicking rasp in every shadow. The aftermath is, there is no aftermath. No closure, no going back to a normal life. I drift from town to town, odd jobs to keep gas in the tank. Some nights I pick a fight in some backwoods bar, almost hoping one of the locals is more than they seem, hoping to settle this thing once and for all. Because that's the worst part, the thing that gnaws at my soul. It knows I'm out there somewhere. We're bound together now, hunter and hunted. And one day, in some dark stretch of forgotten highway or in the heart of a silent forest, our paths will cross again. Maybe then, finally, one of us won't walk away. My name's Ethan Grant. Been with the agency 15 years, and this happened to me in 2019. Before then, I'd handled counterintelligence, mostly. Desk jockey with a knack for sniffing out bad apples, the kind of stuff that never makes the news. Then came this assignment. They called it Anomalous Wildlife Incidents, which translated means the stuff even the widows and other departments couldn't explain away. I'm not a superstitious guy, figured it'd be disgruntled ranchers, bad intel, that kind of thing. First case took me to Wyoming. Vast, empty stretch of land, not a person for miles. Reports of mutilated cattle. Locals whispered chupacabra, but those old tales were all we had. Sheriff was a no-nonsense type named Clara. Didn't believe in monsters, but you could see the strain behind her eyes. That place had a way of getting to you. Examined one of the carcasses. It wasn't like any predator I'd ever seen. Wounds were precise, surgical. Almost like it dissected the poor thing. But I had a job to do, so I set up cameras, night vision, the works. Then, just waited. Nights out there are different. Silence becomes this, thing, pressing down on you. And the stars, they're so damn close, like they could reach out and pluck you from the earth. Got me thinking all kinds of crazy thoughts. Third night it happened. Saw movement flicker on the monitor. Grainy image, but enough. This thing, it wasn't an animal. Tall, hunched, moving with a jerking, unnatural grace. Its skin looked smooth, hairless, but somehow textured. Its head, bulbous, too big for its body. And the eyes... That's what got me. Wide, set low on its face, and shining faintly even in the darkness. Not like reflected light. They glowed with their own internal source. My heart started pounding. This, this violated everything I thought I knew about the world. The creature approached a cow, its long spindly arms reaching out. Then, the connection cut out, camera feed just static. Panic surged through me. I grabbed my rifle, even though I knew it was probably useless, then burst out of the trailer. The creature was hunched over the cow. But it wasn't feeding. It had this, proboscis, this long, tubular thing inserted into the animal's hide. Was it draining it? Laying eggs? I didn't know and didn't want to get close enough to find out. Took aim squeezed the trigger. The sound cracked through the night, 
impossibly loud. The creature let out a piercing shriek and dropped the cow, whipping around to face me. Its eyes burned brighter, filled with what I can only describe as a malevolent intelligence. It lunged. I barely had time to raise my rifle before it slammed into me. Pain exploded from my shoulder, and I went down hard. I scrambled back, trying to get another shot off, but it was too fast. Leaping, circling me with that unsettling, jerking movement. Desperation fueled me. I swung the rifle like a club, managed to connect with its side. The thing hissed, stumbling backwards. It looked at me with those glowing eyes, and it was almost like it was, weighing its options. Then, with a final echoing shriek, it darted off into the darkness. I was left alone in the field, gasping for breath, wounded, and staring at the empty night. It took hours to gather myself enough to limp back to the trailer. Reported the incident, like a good little agent. But they treated it like equipment malfunction, possible drug-induced hallucination. Even showed me satellite imagery with zero heat signatures matching my description like I never even saw the damn thing. Clara gave me a sympathetic look over coffee before I left. Said, This land gets in your blood. Makes you see things, especially if you're looking hard enough. She was right, of course. But sometimes, I lie awake at night and feel those eyes on me, that alien intelligence. Makes me wonder. Months later, there were more incidents. Similar reports spattered across the continent. Sometimes, a lone rancher would disappear, never to be found. They pulled me from field duty, buried me in paperwork analyzing the cases. Every new file felt like a break in the wall they were building between me and the truth. I knew there were others in the agency who'd seen things, things filed away in locked vaults. Things like me. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. Walked into my director's office, turned in my badge. Couldn't be complicit in the lie, even if it meant living on the fringe. Now I drift, taking odd jobs, keeping my eyes peeled at the edge of the woods, the corner of the street. I know the truth is out there, because I've seen it. And I know that one day, I'll see those glowing eyes again, and then... Well, then we'll finish what we started in that Wyoming field. My name is Alex Keeler, and this happened to me in 2015. Divorced, one kid I hardly see. Perfect fit for the Bureau's Unconventional Assignments Division. The kind of stuff they laugh off in the movies, but becomes far less funny when it's your life on the line. This particular nightmare took me to Louisiana Bayou Country. A string of disappearances blamed on gators, feral hogs, the usual. Except locals swore this was something different. Spoken whispers of the Rougarou, old Cajun legends. I dismissed it, of course. Focused on practicalities. I set up in a moss-draped shack miles from civilization. Nights there are thick, the hum of insects a constant roar. Cell service died on the drive-in. It felt isolating, and that was before I saw the eyes. First night, just a flicker of yellow in the treetops. Dismissed it as an owl. Second night saw them again, lower down the unsettling feeling they were watching me. By the third night, I'd rigged up floodlights. Wasn't taking any chances. Sleep was fitful in that sweltering shack. Around midnight, a noise jerked me awake. Branches snapping, something moving toward the cabin. The floodlights blazed on, and there it was, silhouetted against the blinding glare. The shock still sits with me. It was. I struggled to even describe it. 
tall as a man, but hunched over on spindly limbs. Its shape was vaguely canine, but far too stretched, the limbs ending in impossibly long claws. And its head, elongated, the muzzle full of needle teeth, with eyes that burn like embers. The Ruguru. My gut lurched. I grabbed my rifle, training kicking in. Fired off a shot more out of desperation than strategy. The creature shrieked, not in pain, but a sound of fury, and darted off into the shadows. Its movement was unnatural, skittering across the ground with jerky, almost insect-like speed. I spent the rest of the night inside, every creak of the floorboard setting my teeth on edge. When dawn broke, I went to search for signs, half expecting nothing. But I found its tracks twisted, deformed footprints, larger than any dog's, the claw marks sunk deep into the mud. Reported what I'd seen, gave a sanitized version, of course. They sent more agents, locals mostly, to sweep the swamp. I knew it was pointless. The creature, whatever it was, was too smart, too perfectly adapted to its environment. I spent another restless week in that cabin, scanning the treeline, waiting for the yellow eyes to reappear. They never did. Back at HQ, I buried myself in the files. Found similar reports, fragmented, from across the south. Decades, centuries even. Native American lore, whispers dismissed as superstition, all describing similar horrors. The pattern was undeniable, and chilling in its implication. These creatures were out there, lurking in the forgotten corners of the country, blending seamlessly with the shadows. I requested reassignment, but my superiors weren't interested. Too invested in keeping this quiet, I suppose. Easier to write off a few backwoods folk than acknowledge the scale of the threat. Handed me a desk job, told me to forget what I'd seen. Instead, I quit. Started drifting across the country, working menial jobs, always with one eye to the wilderness. Spent nights poring over old maps and cryptozoology websites, compiling my own records. Obsessed, sure, but when you've seen that unnatural shape in the shadows, when you've heard that chittering shriek echoing through the trees, well, ignorance isn't much of a comfort. I stumbled across a lead a few months back, another cluster of disappearances. Colorado this time, high in the Rockies. Bought a used truck, loaded up some supplies, and headed west. No illusions about playing the hero. I'm no monster hunter. But I also swore I wouldn't sit behind a desk while those things stalk the night. The drive is long, the truck rattles, and my shoulder aches from an old wound that never quite healed. Sometimes I wonder if I'm chasing my sanity right off a cliff edge. But then I remember that night in the swamp, the gleam of those yellow eyes, and I hit the gas just a little harder. See, the thing about monsters is, they're real. Might not have fangs or magic spells, but their darkness is no less lethal. Question is, when you finally find what's hiding in the shadows, can you look back at yourself in the mirror afterwards? I aim to find out. My name's Jake Maddox. Been with the company for 15 years now. Started in surveillance, but well, certain skills made me prime for unofficial assignments. This happened in 2010. I was mostly flying solo by then, no wife or kids to complicate things. Perfect for the job they had in mind. See, there'd been a rash of disappearances in the Appalachian region. Hikers, hunters, gone without a trace. Locals whispered bear attacks, meth cookers gone violent, all the usual. But there was an undercurrent of old fears, stories of things that hid in the hollers. 
the kind of stories that make rational men uneasy around campfires. They sent me in posing as a park ranger. Figured the locals might talk to one of their own. I set up camp near a trail where the most recent vanishings occurred. Those mountains, they get to you. Not just the silence, but the sense of age. Like the rocks themselves have seen things men were never meant to. First few days were uneventful. Standard patrols, friendly chats with the occasional hiker. Then came the night that changed everything. I was doing a perimeter sweep near dusk when I found it, a campsite, recently abandoned. Gear was scattered, tent ripped open. Blood smeared across the rocks. And the smell, it was like copper mixed with something rotten and foul. The rational part of me screamed bear attack. But I'd seen enough to know better. Whatever did this, it wasn't an animal. I followed the signs deeper into the woods. Night fell, full and moonless. The only light was my flashlight, cutting a weak path through the ancient trees. Then I heard it, a rustling in the undergrowth, something moving parallel to me. I froze, gun raised, scanning the darkness. My heart hammered against my ribs. Every instinct screamed to run, but training took over. I moved forward, slow and steady. Then I saw it, a shape, hunched in the shadows. At first, I thought it was a man. Then it turned towards me. That's when the true horror hit. It was tall, too tall, limbs impossibly thin. The head was, stretched, elongated into a tapering snout lined with rows of jagged teeth. But the worst part were the eyes. Large, reflective, and glowing with a sickly yellow light that seemed to pierce my very soul. It hissed, a sound like steam escaping a pipe. I fired, more out of panic than aim. The creature shrieked and darted away, its inhumanly long legs carrying it across the ground with unnatural speed. I gave chase, adrenaline coursing through me but by the time I reached the place where it had vanished there was no sign but a few drops of black, foul-smelling liquid. I spent the rest of the night tracking it. The signs were unmistakable. Twisted footprints the size of dinner plates, shredded bark on trees where its claws had raked. I even found the remains of its kill, a half-eaten deer carcass, stripped of flesh with surgical precision. At dawn, I staggered back to camp. I filed the report, edited ruthlessly to remove anything too unbelievable. Within days, the standard response, search team, some vague statements for the press, case closed. Like those missing folks had just evaporated into thin air. But I knew what I saw. They dismissed me, said it was stress over work. Told me to take leave, clear my head like a nice vacation on the beach would erase that chilling image from my mind. I never went back to the Appalachians. But sometimes, at night, I can still feel its eyes on me, that unholy yellow glow burning through the darkness. I've searched for records, anything resembling what I encountered. Old legends, obscure scientific reports. There are others like me who have seen the creatures lurking in the shadows hunted by things that defy reason. Couple of years back, I walked away from the company. Now I drift from town to town, our jobs to pay the bills. Always keeping an eye on the tree line, listening for that hissing shriek in the wind. See, the worst part isn't the fear, it's the knowledge that they're out there. Patient, intelligent, and far more numerous than anyone suspects. The fight isn't over. Not by a long shot. And somewhere, on a lonely stretch of road or a darkening forest path, I might just cross paths with that yellow-eyed monster once again. When I do, well, let's just say I'll be ready.
My name's Ethan Price. Been with the agency for longer than I care to admit. Worked counterterrorism mostly, the kind of stuff that gives you ulcers and keeps you up at night. But this mission back in 2014, it was different. Worse, somehow. They sent me to investigate a cluster of disappearances along the main coast. Small towns, fishing communities, the kind of places where everyone knows your business. At first, it seemed like typical backwoods stuff, runaways, petty feuds spun out of control. But there were whispers, stories locals told with their voices low, about something out there in the fog. They figured I'd smooth things over, offer vague government reassurances. Instead, I found something far more terrifying than any conspiracy theory. The first body they pulled from the sea. I wish I could forget it. It looked like it had been caught in a giant fishing net, skin shredded and bleached in unnatural white. Half the face was just gone, like something had knotted off with sickening precision. The locals muttered the old name, the one spoken only behind closed doors. The Riptide Walker. Some kind of folklore, a boogeyman to explain away the tragedies of the ocean. Only, I'd seen enough to know that sometimes the monsters are more real than we want to believe. I requested support, got it after a bureaucratic tangle that made me want to pull my hair out. A small team, marine biologists, tacticians. We set up base in an abandoned lighthouse, the perfect place to watch the churning gray sea. I spent those first nights on the balcony when whipping at my face, straining to see shapes in the fog. It plays tricks on your mind, that endless expanse of gray. The team was on edge but professional. That changed when Harris didn't come back from his night patrol. We found him near dawn, washed up on the rocks. His body was mangled, but far more disturbing was the expression frozen on his face, stark, wide-eyed terror. One of the biologists, a woman named Dr. Ellis, pointed out the lack of blood around his remains. Most wounds would bleed profusely. These looked surgically clean. That's when the true horror of what we faced started to crystallize. This wasn't a mindless predator. It was calculating methodical. We laid a trap. Used ourselves as bait. I hated the idea sacrificing my team, but it was the only chance of catching this thing. Nights on that windswept balcony became an agonizing vigil. Then, one foggy morning it appeared. Emerging from the mist, it was far taller than a man, hunched over on spindly limbs. Its skin was translucent, slick like a fish belly, revealing a disturbingly intricate skeletal structure. The head was... I still struggled to describe it. Bulbous, tapered, with a lipless mouth that opened sideways, full of needle-like teeth. Its eyes were lidless, milky white orbs that seemed to fixate on us with dispassionate intelligence. The team opened fire. Bullets tore through its flesh, punching fist-sized holes, but it kept moving. It shrieked, a sound like fingernails on a chalkboard and threw itself into the sea with unnatural speed. We never got a clean shot, and just like that, it vanished back into the fog. In the aftermath, I found Dr. Ellis sitting alone staring out at the ocean. She was the only one who truly understood what we'd encountered. We talked for hours, theorizing. Some kind of deep-sea creature, forced to the surface by changing ecosystems, or some genetic experiment gone hideously wrong. Yet it seemed too intelligent, too focused for any of those explanations. Official report went down as, Animal attack? Of course. They buried Harris quietly, dismissed us. I stuck around those coastal towns for a while, trying to find more victims, more clues. There was nothing. The Riptide Walker... Whatever it was, 
had retreated back to its watery domain, leaving nothing but unanswered questions and a lingering sense of dread. Years later, I still dream of that pale, tapered face. The milky eyes. Some cases stay with you, seep into your bones. I left the agency not long after Maine. Worked as a private investigator for a bit, but the shadows felt a little too long, a little too filled with unseen shapes. Now, I teach self-defense classes to jittery suburban moms. It's safer, quieter. But sometimes, when the wind howls just right, and the fog rolls in, I remember that lighthouse, the churning sea, and the knowledge that the world is far stranger and far darker than we suspect. My name's Mason Reed, and this happened to me back in 2008. Ex-Army, recruited into one of those off-the-books divisions of the CIA that nobody likes to talk about. My wife thought I worked in logistics. Safer that way for everyone. This particular nightmare unfolded in the Alaskan wilderness. We'd been tracking an increase in disappearances, way too high even for a place as unforgiving as Alaska. Hikers, hunters, even a team of geologists, vanished without a trace. Locals blamed weather, grizzlies, the usual. But the higher-ups suspected something, more. I was sent in undercover, posing as a wildlife photographer. Set up camp in a remote valley, miles from civilization. Alaska in winter, it has a way of getting into your head. The silence isn't empty, it's alive, pressing down on you. And the nights, the darkness is so pure, you feel like you could fall into it and never touch bottom. The first week was uneventful, almost boring. Then came the blizzard. Wind howled like a wounded animal. My tent was barely holding on. It was almost a relief when the radio crackled, a distress call from another team in the area. They'd found something, something they couldn't explain. Before the storm cut the signal, they gave me their coordinates. I considered waiting it out. I'm not ashamed to admit the rational part of me was screaming to stay put. But duty's a hell of a thing, and those people out there, there was a chance I could help. I geared up, loaded my rifle, and set out into the whirling snow. It took hours to reach their coordinates. It felt like walking through a white void. The storm had reshaped the terrain, burying landmarks. When I finally stumbled upon their camp, it was a scene of carnage. Tents ripped to shreds, gear scattered, and blood smeared across the snow. Not bare attack, this was deliberate, methodical. That's when I saw the tracks. I've hunted everything from deer to insurgents, and I'd never seen anything like them. Large, three-toed, the claw marks sunk deep. Following the trail led me upslope, into the heart of the blizzard. Then I saw it, a hulking silhouette moving against the blinding white. It was tall, at least seven feet, its frame hunched and emaciated looking. For clung to its patchy skin, revealing glimpses of bone and sinew. The head was, it looked almost canine, but elongated into a muzzle that seemed too long, too full of teeth. It turned towards me, and I'll never forget those eyes. They glowed yellow in the storm, filled not with animal instinct but a chilling intelligence. In that moment, I understood this wasn't just a predator. This was something calculating, something that saw me as the prey. It lunged. I barely had time to raise my rifle and fire. The shots hit, I swear they did but the thing didn't even flinch. It shrieked, a piercing sound that cut through the storm, and launched itself at me with impossible speed. I scrambled back, lost my footing and tumbled down the slope, my rifle flying from my grasp. 
I saw it looming above me, that skeletal form silhouetted against the swirling snow, its claws outstretched. I closed my eyes, expecting the killing blow. Then a gunshot echoed, not from my rifle. The creature screamed in fury. I opened my eyes in time to see a figure charging through the blizzard, firing wildly at the beast. Another operative, just in the nick of time. Together, we drove it back, the storm providing enough cover for it to disappear into the wilderness. We regrouped back at what was left of my camp, the snow beginning to let up. My backup, Novak his name was, helped me patch up the worst of the gashes on my arm from when I fell. While we worked, I saw the grim set of his jaw, the tension in his shoulders. You ever see something like that? I asked. He didn't look at me, just shook his head. The reports, the things they tell us back in Langley. Novak paused, searching for the right words. Sometimes it's better not to know. Better to write it off as bears, bad luck, the stories crazy locals tell. We filed our reports, of course. Played down the encounter. The agency doesn't like loose ends, unexplained phenomena. They sent in a clean-up crew, buried the whole incident. Me? They offered a transfer, a desk job somewhere warm. I turned them down. I'm still out there, bouncing from one frozen wasteland to the next. Can't say I blame those old-timers who whisper about things man wasn't meant to see. Sometimes, ignorance is truly bliss, and out there in the wild places, that ignorance is getting harder and harder to find. My name is Carter James and this happened to me in October of 1994. I worked for a secret division of the CIA. If you've never heard about it before, don't be surprised. We were very good at what we did. Our assignment was in the dense forests of Oregon. There was this group we had been tracking for a couple of months, suspected in several strange disappearances. Not your everyday garden variety crime ring, mind you. These guys were into something way out there. There were rumors of strange rituals, the kind of stuff that would put the creeps in an occult bookstore owner. The squad consisted of myself, Murphy, and Jackson. Murph I knew well. We even went back to elementary school together. Tough guy, built like a linebacker, and had a knack for explosives. Jackson was our tech guy always had some sort of experimental gadget strapped to him. We tracked the suspects for three long days and nights through the sprawling Oregon wilderness. One morning, near dawn, we finally caught sight of their remote camp. Jackson whispered something in his mic, and then a grainy view of the camp popped up on my heads-up display. There were four of them, armed to the teeth, sitting around a dimly lit bonfire. Muff and I exchanged glances, his thick brows furrowing. We had to move. We split up. Murph covered the right flank, Jackson took the higher ground to the left, and I would charge head on. The sun wouldn't rise for another hour or so, and we had the element of surprise on our side. I started slowly making my way through the woods, the dead leaves crackling under my boots with every step. As I got closer, the chanting grew louder. Suddenly, Jackson broke radio silence. Carter, watch out, he whispered urgently. I'm picking up something on my sensors, something big. Before I could question him further, I heard a terrifying howl rip through the air. It was not an animal I could recognize, a sound filled with rage and unearthly hunger. In the dim light... A massive silhouette erupted from the trees, moving with unnatural speed. It was on me in a flash. I rolled to the side just in time to avoid its claws, my rifle tumbling into the leaves. 
The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen. It stood easily seven feet tall, its form shrouded in wiry fur, its arms long and grotesque with razor-sharp talons. Its eyes glowed with a menacing yellow, and its mouth was an array of jagged teeth. Terror seized me, but my training kicked in. I scrambled to my feet, searching for my rifle, even though I knew it would do no good against something like this. The creature was moving, closing in, a predator ready for the kill. Then came a crack of gunfire from the other side, followed by another. It was Murphy. The thing jerked its massive head, blood splattering the leaves. Its snarl filled the air. Murph was drawing its attention away from me. Move, Carter! Get out of there! His voice was strained. My heart hammered in my chest. I scrambled through the undergrowth, trying to put distance between myself and the monster. Every sense was on fire, my ears straining for the sounds of pursuit. I needed a plan. Where was Jackson? And what the hell were we dealing with? Murph! I whispered desperately into my mic. What is that thing? Damn if I know, Carter! Just keep moving! The reply was cut short by what sounded like a struggle, and then the crackle of the mic going dead. I could hear the creature's heavy panting. It wouldn't be long before it locked on to me. My throat burned as I bolted through the trees, the damp undergrowth snagging at my clothes. My mind raced. The clearing where we had stashed our transport was up ahead. If I could just make it there, maybe, maybe I could signal for backup, get some goddamn air support in here. But even as I thought it, I knew. This thing, this creature from my deepest nightmares, it would hunt me down. It might even let me get close to the clearing, might let that flicker of hope ignite within me just so it could rip it away. A sick, twisted game. Just when I thought my lungs would burst, I saw a glimmer of light through the trees. The clearing. I pushed myself, the adrenaline numbing the throbbing ache in my ribs where I must have cracked them in my tumble from the creature's first attack. A blast of sound broke through the trees behind me, a gunshot, followed by a chilling shriek. Jackson. Had the creature somehow circled back? Fear squeezed my heart, but I kept running. I was so close, I could see the outline of our vehicle, nestled at the edge of the clearing. Desperate, I dug into my pockets and found the detonator. It was our last resort, a charge powerful enough to level the entire clearing, and take me with it. Wired into the vehicle, it would be enough to attract attention, maybe even injure the beast, if I could get close enough. I charged across the last stretch, diving towards the vehicle, my fingers fumbling for the activation sequence. The creature crashed out of the trees right behind me. Its roar was deafening, its stench overwhelming, hot breath that reeked of something old and rotten. There was no time for hesitation. I punched in the activation code and threw myself to the damp earth, covering my head. A split second later, the explosion tore through the forest. Fire bloomed, the shock wave throwing me back. Shrapnel peppered the ground around me, and when I dared to look up, a column of thick, acrid smoke rose towards the sky. I lay there, panting, waiting for the creature's death throes waiting for the inevitable, horrible silence. It didn't come. Somehow, impossibly, it was still moving. A wave of nausea washed over me. It wouldn't be long now. My legs wouldn't obey. My arms felt like lead. I fumbled for my backup pistol, but it was useless. I should have gone for my rifle. I should have, should have... The ground vibrated under me. It was getting closer. I closed my eyes, a bitter laugh escaping my lips turns out those. Live by the sword, die by the sword. 
posters in the CIA gym weren't entirely off the mark. Just as I expected the killing blow, a new sound tore through the air. Helicopter blades. Multiple helicopters. Had they been tracking my signal this entire time? Were they already aware of the thing? Relief washed over me, tinged with the sharp tang of guilt. Murph. Jackson. They were gone. The creature hesitated, a low, confused growl rumbling in its chest. Whatever it was, it didn't like the sound of those approaching helicopters. I saw my chance. I scrambled to my feet and, fueled by the last remnants of fight-or-flight instinct, staggered towards the trees opposite the beast. Then it was in the air. A shadow passed overhead as it fled back into the depths of the forest, its massive form melting into the dense undergrowth with terrifying agility. The helicopters banked, circling. Through the clearing smoke, I spotted movement from the extraction team, their weapons trained into the woods. It took every ounce of strength to raise my arm and a halting wave a signal to them to stand down. The aftermath was a blur. Medical attention, debriefings, endless debriefings. The agency did all of it in its trademark efficient manner, scrubbing the event clean. Officially, our mission in Oregon was to dismantle another run-of-the-mill militia group. Our reported casualty list was brief, my own survival a freak stroke of luck. The truth of the matter was buried deep within classified files, lost under layers of redacted lines. They offered me a desk job, of course. Some cushy backwater division where I wouldn't have to worry about things lurking in the shadows. I almost laughed. After what I had seen, how could I possibly spend my days pushing papers and forgetting the very real monsters that shared this world with us? I didn't take the job. I walked away. The creature haunts me still. In nightmares, sure, but also in broad daylight. Every rustle in the trees, every odd footprint, it could be out there, watching, waiting. My apartment has more locks than a bank vault, and I catch myself sleeping with a knife under my pillow. Some nights, I think about going back. Back to Oregon, or to another forest just like it. Armed to the teeth this time, with a bigger team, better gadgets. Find this creature, whatever the hell it is. End it before it ends someone else. But I never do. Because what if it's not just one? What if there's more of them, and hunting them down would unleash a whole new level of hell on earth? Maybe some stories aren't meant to have endings. Maybe some monsters are better left in the shadows. My name is Derek Mason. This whole mess started in August of 1998, in the sprawling wilderness of the Olympic National Forest. I worked for a classified division of the CIA, the kind that officially doesn't exist, called in when the weirdness hit the fan. My partner, Kayla, was the brains of the operation. Sharp as a whip, with more tech degrees than most people have pairs of shoes. I was the muscle. Ex-military, built like an angry bear, and with a temper to match. We worked well together, yin and yang, all that crap. The mission was something off the deep end, even by our standards. There had been reports of strange sightings in the park, hikers inexplicably vanishing. Rangers found shredded tents, claw marks unlike any known predator in the region and unsettling pools of blood left behind with no bodies. They called us and after some poor park ranger snapped photos of a creature on his motion sensor camera, a hulking bipedal thing, covered in coarse fur, eyes blazing in the darkness like embers. We had been tracking a rogue paramilitary group involved in something called Project Seraph. They were obsessed with gene manipulation, 
trying to create super soldiers of a sort. Rumors were flying about them experimenting with animal DNA, and that photo, it fit too neatly for me to dismiss it. Our job was to track down their base of operations, which Intel suggested was hidden somewhere deep within the Olympic forest. The forest itself was something else. Dense, ancient, a million places for things to hide. We moved slow, nerves on edge, every rustle of leaves setting my teeth on edge. Two days in, Kayla started picking up strange readings on her scanner. There's something, a large heat signature moving parallel with us. Whatever it is, it's fast. Too fast. I swore under my breath. We weren't alone in these woods. Something was keeping tabs on us. We kept moving, trying to get the jump on whatever we were dealing with. That night, we camped in a small clearing. Usually, I'd take the first watch, but Kayla was fussing over her gear, muttering about interference. She insisted I catch a few hours of sleep while she ran diagnostics. I woke not to the sound of an alarm, but to a shriek of pain that made my blood freeze. Kayla! I was on my feet, gun drawn, heart pounding in my chest. Moonlight filtered through the trees, casting everything in eerie silver. Silence hung thick and heavy. And then came another sound, a wet ripping sound, followed by a low guttural growl. My stomach lurched. Kayla's tech station was a mess, equipment smashed and scattered, cables torn loose. A few feet away, her pack lay on the ground, a dark stain spreading across the fabric. I charged out of the clearing, following a trail of trampled brush, my gut twisting in dread. The creature was big, that much was clear from the uprooted bushes and crushed saplings in its wake. Whatever Seraph had cooked up in their twisted labs, it wasn't small. Panic fueled me, a desperate need to find her, or at least find what was left of her. I saw movement ahead. A massive form crouched between the trees, its back to me. In its hands, or rather claws, was... Lord, it was Kayla. Her body was limp her clothes ragged and soaked in blood that shone black in the twilight. I roared, a primal bellow filled with rage. The creature whipped around. It was over seven feet tall, its wiry frame built of lean muscle. In the moonlight, its eyes glowed a terrifying yellow, and its mouth was a jagged array of fangs, dripping with blood. Kayla's blood. It dropped her body to the ground and charged. It moved with deceptive speed, covering the distance between us in seconds. I raised my gun and fired, the shots ringing out in the still forest. The first few rounds hit their mark, but it barely slowed. The thing howled in pain but kept coming. I emptied the rest of my clip into it. It stumbled, dark blood blossoming from wounds across its chest. But still, it lunged for me, its claws raking through the air. I tried to dodge, but it was too fast. Claws ripped across my arm, sending a jolt of searing agony through me. I staggered back, my gun clattering uselessly to the ground. The creature stalked towards me, a low growl rumbling in its throat, its yellow eyes burning with fury. I knew I was next. It wouldn't leave any trace of our team. A flicker of movement caught my eye. A branch lay at my feet, heavy and sturdy. Without thinking, I snatched it up, more of a club than a weapon, but it was all I had. The creature closed in, drool hanging from its fanged maw, a sickening gurgle rising from its throat. I swung the branch in a desperate arc. It struck the beast square across its snout. The creature yelped and snarled, momentarily disoriented. I used the distraction to scramble back, my eyes darting wildly for anything else I could use. My gaze fell on Kayla's scattered tech. There. 
her thermal detonator. If I could just reach it. I lunged forward, snatching at the device. The creature recovered and swiped at me with a massive clawed paw. I felt a searing pain on my shoulder, but I was close now. I fumbled with the detonator, desperately trying to remember the activation sequence was it three presses, or two. The creature snarled, bearing down on me. Just as its massive form loomed over me, its putrid breath washing over my face, I hit the sequence. I squeezed my eyes shut, bracing for the end. The world erupted in a blinding flash. The blast threw me backward, the shockwave knocking the air from my lungs. When I opened my eyes, the clearing was engulfed in smoke and fire. The creature was gone, vanished in the fiery chaos I created. Pain ripped through me. My head pounded, my limbs ached, and nausea lurched in my gut. Through the haze, I spotted the mangled form of Kayla lying in the dirt. I dragged myself over to her, the heat from the fire singing my skin as I reached for her limp body. Even in the firelight, I could see her pallor, the vacant stare of her open eyes. Kayla, no, I choked out, a sob rising in my throat. I stumbled back, falling to my knees in the charred undergrowth. Kayla was gone. And the creature? It could be wounded, but alive, lurking somewhere in the shadows. It wouldn't be long before reinforcements arrived. I needed to get out. Signal for evac, report back, report what? I thought back to the photo, the impossible thing in the woods. The shredded tents, the vanished hikers, everything suddenly clicked into chilling focus. The creature, it wasn't Seraph's creation. It was their first victim, the prototype that had broken free. There were more of them out there. Not a failed super-soldier program, but something far more dangerous, a predator unleashed on the world. And they were hiding in plain sight, written off as wild animal attacks, unsolved disappearances. I staggered to my feet, my movements stiff and clumsy. I reached for my comms unit, but it was damaged beyond repair, just a melted husk. I turned and ran, fleeing the burning clearing. I stumbled through the night, guided only by the stars and a desperate need to put as much distance between me and that nightmare as possible. I had to make it out, had to warn the world. But who would believe me? By dawn, I reached the main road, dirty and ragged, my mind a fragmented mess of grief and horror. I flagged down a passing truck, the driver's eyes wide with fear and confusion at the sight of me. I barely remember the ride to civilization, only frantic mumbling about monsters in the woods and pleas that would surely label me as insane. The aftermath is a haze of debriefings, medical tests, and those damned shrinks who looked at me with thinly veiled pity and scribbled in their notebooks. I kept talking about the creature, and they kept nodding, talking about trauma-induced delusions and the remarkable resilience of the human mind. They patched me up and sent me on my way, quietly branding me a liability. No one found any trace of Kayla or any evidence to corroborate my story. No photos, no footprints, nothing but a burnout patch of forest that the rangers chalked up to a careless camper and a lightning strike. The case of the vanished hikers got quietly swept into the ever-growing pile of unsolved mysteries. I never went back to the CIA, couldn't stomach the thought of desk duty and paperwork after seeing what I saw. I drifted for a while, taking any odd job that kept me moving, kept me looking over my shoulder. Because I knew, deep down, that I wasn't crazy. The creature was still out there maybe even stronger now. It's been years, but I still see its yellow eyes in my dreams, hear Kayla's scream echoing through the trees. Some nights I think about going back. Back to the Olympic forest, or some other godforsaken stretch of wilderness. 
hunting for the thing, proving I wasn't insane. But then I remember, even if I did find it, even if I finally managed to kill the beast, who would believe me? What would change? The world wouldn't be any safer. In a world with things like that lurking in the shadows, nowhere is truly safe. And some things just can't be fought, can't be explained away. It's better to slip back into the shadows myself, to live on the frayed edges of society, forever a haunted man, forever looking over my shoulder. My name is Marcus Pierce, and this happened to me back in September of 2011, deep in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains. Back then, I was running with a specialized CIA team, the sort they tapped for missions that blurred the line between military and science fiction. I'm a skeptic by nature, never one to believe ghost stories or monster sightings, so trust me when I say this was all kinds of messed up. The assignment itself was weird from the start. Something about seismic sensors picking up unusual activity in a remote section of the park. Locals whispered about strange disappearances, and the bigwigs were worried there could be some sort of secret paramilitary operation setting up shop on American soil. We went in expecting to find a rebel camp, not whatever it was we actually encountered. There were three of us, me, Torres and Jackson. Torres was our tech guy, quiet and brilliant, the type who could hack a satellite from his laptop one minute, then crack a self-deprecating joke the next. Jackson was muscle with a heart of gold, a former marine with a grin that could charm the birds out of the trees. He called me Grandpa, since technically I was the oldest out of them. We spent two weeks slogging through those hauntingly beautiful mountains. The air was thick with the smell of pine and damp undergrowth. It felt like something was watching us, every snap of a twig setting us on edge. Torres kept picking up strange readings, but every time we closed in, it was like whatever we were tracking vanished into thin air. One evening, we set up camp near a shallow cave system. Jackson rigged the perimeter with trip wires and motion detectors, his usual meticulous routine. The rest of us were exhausted, but Torres couldn't leave the sensors alone. He kept muttering about energy spikes that didn't make any sense. Torres enough, I finally told him. We'll check it out in the morning, get some sleep. That night, everything went to hell. A sound woke me. Not the alarm system, but an immense cracking and snapping from somewhere above the cave's entrance. I scrambled for my rifle, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm in my chest. Jackson was already shouting, grabbing his own gear. Something's up there. It's big. Torres fumbled with his equipment. The sensors, they're going haywire. Before we could react, the top half of a fallen tree crashed through the mouth of the cave. Dust choked the air, and something lumbered out of the shadows. It stood at least nine feet tall, its form both monstrous and oddly human. Its skin had a rough, mottled texture, mottled in shades of brown and gray like old tree bark. Its legs were impossibly long and powerful, its arms ending in vicious black claws. The thing's eyes burned like embers in its craggy, almost skeletal head. We froze in sheer shock. This wasn't a rebel or a guy in a suit. This was a nightmare ripped from the darkest corner of the forest. It let out a screech that shook the cave, a deafening mixture of animal roar and something else. Then it charged. I opened fire, the gun bucking in my hands. Torres and Jackson joined in, a deafening barrage of bullets echoing through the confined space. The creature staggered under the onslaught but didn't go down. It ripped one of Jackson's motion sensors free with a swipe of its claws, the metal twisting like a paper clip. 
Jackson, move! Torres yelled. Jackson scrambled back, but too slow. The creature lunged for him, its massive jaws snapping shut inches from his face. Jackson brought up his rifle and fired point-blank into the creature's chest. Blood splattered, dark and thick, and it roared in pain. But it wasn't enough. With sickening speed, the creature swiped its claws across Jackson's midsection. He let out a strangled cry, dropping his rifle and crumpling to the ground. The creature moved to finish him. No! I roared and charged at the beast, slamming the butt of my rifle into its head. It reeled, momentarily disoriented. Torres seized the chance and sprinted past us towards Jackson, dragging him further into the cave. I followed, firing backwards to buy them time. The creature turned its blazing eyes on me and lunged. The cave tunnel narrowed and the air grew thick with a musty, ancient smell. I could hear the creature's heavy footfalls behind me, the echoing scrape of its claws on the rock. Each breath rasped in my throat as I stumbled deeper into the darkness. Torres, how far? I called out, my voice echoing eerily off the stone walls. Dead end up here. Torres' voice was tight with fear. We're trapped. I glanced back in time to see the creature's massive form emerge from the shadows. Panic sliced through me, but I shoved it down. There was only one way out of this. Can you reach those thermal detonators? I yelled over my shoulder. Yeah, wait, what are you? Set him off, Torres, I commanded. On my mark. The creature was gaining on me its screeching getting louder with every stride. I risked another glance back and saw it crouched, ready to spring. I held my ground and took aim. I had a few shots left. I had to make them count. The creature launched itself towards me. I squeezed the trigger, firing until the gun clicked empty. Bullets tore into its flesh, and it howled in rage but kept coming. Just as I thought I was about to be ripped apart. Now, Torres! I screamed. A series of deafening explosions erupted behind me. The cave shook violently, and the air was filled with blinding light, dust, and the stench of sulfur. When my vision cleared, I saw a pile of rubble blocking the passage. The creature was gone, buried under tons of rock if Torres had done his job right. My legs nearly gave out beneath me. I stumbled over to where Torres had dragged Jackson. We knelt beside him, and even in the dim light, I could see the damage the creature had inflicted. His breasts were ragged gasps, and his eyes were wide with a terror that went deeper than just the pain. Jackson, I wanted to say something reassuring but the words stuck in my throat. Torres squeezed Jackson's shoulder. His voice shook. Hey, buddy, we're gonna get out of here. Jackson offered up a weak ghost of his old grin. You two idiots better. He coughed, blood flecking his lips. We did what we could to patch him up, to make him comfortable, but deep down, we all knew. Time was running out. The radio was busted in the collapse, and God only knew how long it would take for anyone to realize we were missing. We talked then, the three of us. We talked about our lives, about the stupid jokes and near misses of our missions. We shared the sort of things you don't say until your back's against the wall. Jackson went quiet as the sun slipped away outside the cave. Torres held his hand and I sat beside them, the silence heavy in the small space. When he was gone, I looked at Torres, my eyes burning. He looked back, his face etched with grief. What the hell was that thing, Torres? He shook his head. I don't know. The readings, it didn't make sense. Animal, but not twisted somehow. We stayed until dawn 
then started the grueling task of digging through the rubble. It took nearly two days to clear a path wide enough to squeeze out of the cave. By the time we emerged battered and exhausted, a full search party was already combing the area. The aftermath was the same mess it always seems to be. Debriefings, evaluations, and those piercing silences from the brass that asked without asking if we'd cracked under the pressure out there. Torres tried to explain about the creature, but they dismissed him. Wild animal attack fueled by shock, they said. They patched me up, pronounced me fit for duty, and shoved the whole incident under a bureaucratic rug labeled classified. Some time later, I found Torres at a bar we used to frequent after particularly rough missions. We didn't even need to talk at first. He ordered me a shot, something strong that burned on the way down, and we just sat together in the dim light. I keep seeing it, Torres said finally, staring into his glass. The way it moved those eyes. Yeah, me too. Jackson too. My voice trailed off. There was nothing to be said, really. I never went back to the CIA. I drifted for a while, taking odd jobs here and there. Haunted. They all say PTSD does that to a person, twists up reality in your head. Maybe they're right. Or maybe there are monsters out there that don't fit neatly into any textbook creatures lurking in the shadows of places we tell ourselves are safe. Nights are the worst. I dream of the great smoky mountains, a place of terrible beauty. I dream of Jackson's laugh and Torres' quiet brilliance, lost to whatever ancient evil still stirs in that place. I dream of the creature, its yellow eyes blazing in the darkness, a stark reminder that some battles can't be won. Some things can't be unseen. And I always wake wondering, with a cold dread settling deep in my bones, whether it dreams of me. My name's Grant Miller, and this whole mess happened back in November 2008. Back then... I was running with a specialized unit within the CIA, handling jobs that were equal parts dangerous and bizarre. Think less James Bond, more X-Files. I'm the kind of guy who prides himself on staying calm under pressure, but let's just say that experience put my composure to the test. The job seemed simple enough on the surface— investigate unusual wildlife sightings in a remote section of Yellowstone National Park. We thought it was probably some rancher's experiment gone wrong or a hoax to drum up tourism. What we encountered in those woods was, let's just say bears and mountain lions are the least scary things lurking in the American wilderness. Our team was four strong me, Nguyen, Carter, and Brooks. Nguyen was our tech expert, the kind of guy who could hack a UFO if he had to. Carter was the muscle, ex-military with a deadpan sense of humor that would have been funny if we weren't constantly on the brink of getting torn apart. Brooks was our wildlife specialist, and probably the sanest one of the bunch. We set out into the park in early autumn. Yellowstone's a breathtaking place, the kind that reminds you how small a person is in the grand scheme of things. But there was unease in the air, a prickling at the back of my neck that told me those woods weren't as pristine as they seemed. The first few days were mostly about tracking. We found enormous, clawed footprints that didn't match any known animal in the region. Brooks nearly fainted when he found Scott the size of a basketball and one's equipment picked up strange energy readings he swore shouldn't be possible. But the creature itself stayed elusive. We built camp in a clearing near a stream. It felt more exposed than usual, but it was the best we could find given the terrain. Carter rigged the perimeter with infrared sensors as usual, his gruff voice cutting through the silent forest. You think those little wires are gonna stop whatever made those tracks? 
I asked him, only half joking. He shrugged, his face unreadable in the twilight. Gives us a warning at least. Night fell quickly, and with it came an unnerving silence. No rustling leaves or animal calls, just this oppressive stillness. Nguyen spent the evening hunched over his laptop, muttering about corrupted data and impossible frequencies. Sleep was fitful. I woke with a start, a sense of wrongness hanging heavy in the air. It wasn't a sound that woke me, but the absence of it. Suddenly, an air-splitting screech tore through the night. It was high-pitched, filled with fury, and unlike anything I'd ever heard. Carter's perimeter alarms went haywire, flashing madly in the darkness. We got movement, multiple targets, big! His voice was a tense whisper through the comms. I grabbed my rifle and scrambled out of the tent. The others weren't far behind, their faces pale in the beams of our flashlights. Out there, just at the edge of the light, multiple pairs of eyes shone at us, brilliant, predatory yellow. Then the creatures stepped out of the darkness. Each one was a monstrosity. They stood at least seven feet tall, their bodies covered in a thick, matted fur that looked like it could turn aside bullets. But the worst was their heads. Muzzles stretched out into wolf-like snouts filled with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Their eyes burned with that impossible yellow light, filled with a chilling intelligence. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the silent forest. The creatures shrieked in rage and charged. Nguyen went down first. One of the creatures lunged for him, its wickedly curved claws ripping through his Kevlar vest, spraying gore across the damp earth. He barely had time to scream. Carter roared and unleashed a fresh volley of gunfire, driving several of the creatures back. He grabbed Nguyen's radio, his voice shaking. We need backup now. I repeat, we. A terrifying blur of movement, and Carter was gone. Snatched from the ground so fast I barely registered it. All that remained was his gun, lying forgotten in the grass. Brooks and I were back to back, spraying desperate shots into the darkness. One of the creatures went down, a thick black ichor oozing from a chest wound, but there were still at least three of them. They were toying with us, enjoying the hunt. Brooks let out a strangled cry as one of the monsters circled behind him. Before I could react it lunged, its immense jaws clamping around his leg. He screamed in agony firing blindly into the creature, but it dragged him bodily into the trees. His gunshots rang out, then were abruptly, chillingly cut off. I was alone. Panic was a jagged shard of ice in my veins, but I forced it down. There was no time for fear. The smell of blood hung thick in the air, Nguyen's, Carter's, Brooks. It was the smell of death and those monstrous eyes were still there in the shadows, watching me, calculating. I stumbled backwards, desperately trying to reload as the creatures advanced. Somewhere in the back of my mind, a voice was screaming about protocol, about securing evidence, but all I could think about was survival. Then I tripped over a tree root and tumbled to the ground, my rifle clattering away out of reach. I scrambled back, fumbling blindly in my pack for my backup sidearm. My fingers brushed against the cold metal of the pistol just as a monstrous form leaped towards me. I squeezed the trigger, again and again, the roar of gunfire deafening in the sudden stillness. The creature reared up, its guttural shriek cutting through the night. Dark blood splattered the ground, and with a final, shuddering spasm, it collapsed. My hands shook as I struggled to my feet. But there were still two of them out there. I knew even then that I wasn't going to make it off that mountain. It was just a matter of how long I could hold them off. I wasn't going down without a fight. I fumbled for something, 
anything in my bag that might give me an inch. My hand closed around a flare. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. With shaking fingers, I struck the flare and hurled it towards the remaining creatures. It landed at their feet, hissing and sparking, casting garish red light across their monstrous forms. They backed away, snarling. Fire, primal and unpredictable. Maybe it spooked them. I took my chance. I sprinted through the trees, ignoring the stabbing pain in my side from my earlier fall. I had no idea where I was going, but anywhere had to be better than that clearing. The creatures roared in anger behind me, but they didn't pursue, at least not immediately. I ran until I thought my lungs would burst. Branches tore at my face and the ground was uneven, but I didn't dare stop. Finally, gasping for breath, I collapsed behind a fallen log the pulse pounding in my ears so loud I could barely hear the creatures crashing through the woods in my wake. How long they searched for me, I don't know. After a while, blessed silence descended. I lay there, my body throbbing, waiting for the inevitable, but the attack never came. Perhaps they had given up, or were waiting for daylight. Either way, it bought me some time. As dawn broke, I pushed myself up and started moving again, stumbling through the dense undergrowth. I had no destination in mind, only the blind instinct to put as much distance as possible between myself and that blood-soaked clearing. By some miracle, I found a ranger station later that day. It was deserted, the radio equipment dead but I managed to patch my wounds and send out a garbled distress signal on the emergency broadcast band. Rescue arrived two days later. My wild story of monsters in the woods was met with skepticism, with thinly veiled assumptions of shock-induced delusions. It took weeks of debriefings and psych evaluations before the brass was satisfied I would keep my mouth shut and fall in line. The aftermath is a blur. There were cover stories, hushed whispers about rogue bear attacks, and missing persons reports quietly buried in park archives. No evidence of the creatures was ever found. My team was declared officially dead, their names added to a memorial somewhere in Langley that they don't make a big show about to the public. I never did go back to the CIA. I left that life behind and tried to bury the memory of that night deep within me. You can go ahead and call me crazy, call me traumatized. I won't argue with you. Sometimes, late at night, I see those yellow eyes in the darkness and hear Nguyen scream echoing through the trees. Most days, I manage to convince myself it was a nightmare, a hallucination born from exhaustion and terror. I tell myself that those creatures couldn't possibly be real, that the rational world I cling to hasn't devolved entirely into chaos. But on some nights, when the wind whispers through the trees outside my window, sounding eerily like a deathly screech, I start to doubt my own sanity. Because I know what I saw out there, what tore my team apart. And in the deepest hours of the night, a terrifying truth remains— we were the lucky ones that day. If those creatures were smart enough to toy with us, to hunt us for sport, who knows how many others they took? There's a darkness in those woods, a primal, ancient hunger. And the most horrifying thought of all is this, perhaps, even now, they're still out there, waiting, watching, and biding their time. My name's Alex Tanner, and the mess I'm about to tell you about happened back in August of 2014. I'm a field operative for the CIA, the kind of guy sent in when things go sideways. The weirder the circumstances, the better suited I am for the job. I've been a lot of places, seen a lot of things, 
but nothing prepared me for the Adirondack Mountains. We were tracking some chatter about a rogue paramilitary group experimenting with genetic modification, supposedly messing around with animal DNA to create something off the books. My team was two other seasoned CIA agents, Novak and Ramirez, and a biologist, Dr. Walsh. We always brought a specialist along for jobs like these. Novak was ex-army rangers, built like a bear with nerves of steel. Ramirez, our tech specialist, was always cracking terrible jokes to lighten the mood. Dr. Walsh, though brilliant, was maybe the least outdoors a person you could imagine. Didn't stop her from complaining about how primitive our camp setup was. The Adirondacks are beautiful, but in an untamed, primal sort of way, thick with ancient forests and crisscrossed by old logging trails. We were deep in, miles from the nearest sign of civilization. The local rumors were pretty outlandish something huge, with glowing eyes, attacking hikers and vanishing without a trace. I figured it was probably a bear, maybe infected with rabies, but orders were orders. We spent two weeks hunting for any sign of the supposed facility. Nights were chilly, the ground hard, and our packs were getting lighter. Morale was slipping, and even I was starting to think this was a wild goose chase. Then came the fourth night. I woke to a sound like someone dragging a wet sack of meat across the forest floor. I nudged Novak awake, and we listened in the pitch-black silence. Then we heard it again, a deep, scraping, snuffling sound that sent shivers down my spine. We woke Ramirez and Dr. Walsh, trying to stay quiet, but it didn't matter. The thing knew we were there. I flipped on my night vision. The world outside our tents was washed in shades of eerie green. Novak whispered for Dr. Walsh to stay close. The clearing was dead silent except for our own ragged breathing. And then it charged. The creature burst from the shadows, an unholy fusion of animal and nightmare. It was massive, twice the size of any bear, moving with unnatural speed and ferocity. Its eyes gleamed in the night vision like hot coals. It was all muscle and teeth, a patchwork chimera of coarse fur, ragged claws, and raw, pulsing sinew. The stench of it, rotting meat and something sulfurous, made me gag. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the night, but the creature barely flinched. It slammed into Novak, sending him sprawling, his gun flying from his hand. Novak screamed as the creature raked its claws across his back, tearing his pack open like it weighed nothing. Ramirez grabbed Dr. Walsh and bolted into the woods. Through the chaos, I caught a glimpse of the doctor fumbling with her pack, pulling out a syringe. It's a sedative! She yelled over the beast's screeches. Just distract it! I fired another volley into the creature, more to buy them time than inflict any real harm. It roared and spun, giving chase to Ramirez and Dr. Walsh. I took the chance, sprinting across the clearing towards Novak, who was slumped against the tree. The creature was gaining, closing the distance with disturbing speed. Ramirez tossed a flare behind it, a burst of bright red light in the sea of night vision green. The creature paused, confused, and Dr. Walsh seized the moment. She ran in with surprising agility burying the syringe in the monster's thick hide. The effect was almost immediate. It faltered, let out a shuddering, strangled cry, then lumbered a few more steps before collapsing into the undergrowth. I reached Novak. Blood was seeping through his jacket from deep gashes across his back. He gritted his teeth in pain, but his eyes were wide with a manic sort of energy. What the hell was that thing? he rasped. I don't know. I breathed, scanning the woods for any sign of our teammates. But whatever it was, it's down for now. 
Ramirez and Dr. Walsh emerged from the trees. The doctor was shaking, her face pale. Did it get you? she asked, scanning Ramirez for wounds. He shook his head, still catching his breath. Just then, we heard a rustling nearby. Our guns swung up, our nerves stretched to breaking point. But it was just a deer, its eyes wide with terror as it bolted past our camp, fleeing whatever horrors lurked deeper in the woods. The morning air crackled with tension. The sedative wouldn't last long, and we weren't sticking around to find out what happened next. Novak needed urgent medical attention. His wounds were ragged and dangerously deep. We rigged up a makeshift stretcher and started moving, hoping to reach the extraction point before nightfall. Dr. Walsh took tissue samples from the downed creature while the rest of us patched each other up as best we could. Her hands were shaking, a mix of residual terror and scientific fascination. Can you make any sense of this? I asked, nodding at the hulking mass. She held up a vial of blood, its color an unnatural, murky maroon. The closest I can figure, it's like a mix of wolf, bear, maybe something I don't even recognize. But there's more. Trace elements I can't identify. Whatever they were doing in that lab, it tampered with the very building blocks of this thing's DNA. That explained the speed, the ferocity. It wasn't an animal in the normal sense. It was something engineered, a weapon disguised as a wild beast. Trekking through the dense woods was agonizingly slow, especially hauling Novak. We swapped carrying the stretcher, our progress growing more halting as exhaustion set in. Dr. Walsh kept muttering to herself, analyzing every rustle of leaves on the breeze. She was convinced that there were more of the creatures out there, and with the sedative wearing off. Ramirez, usually the most light-hearted of the group, was unusually quiet. He kept glancing over his shoulder, a sheen of nervous sweat on his face. Finally, as dusk painted the forest in shades of gloom, he burst out. I can't do this anymore. We're sitting ducks. It'll be back, and next time. He didn't finish, but his fear was a palpable thing, squeezing at my own heart. We argued into the night, tension simmering. Ramirez wanted to split up, each of us trying our luck alone in the dark woods. Novak, despite his injuries, insisted we stick together saying it was our best chance. Dr. Walsh drifted away from the argument, mumbling equations about rate of dosage and the unknown time until the sedative wore off entirely. In the end, we compromised. It was a foolish compromise born of desperation, but it was the only thing we could all agree on. We would stick together until daybreak, then reassess. At least in the dawn light, we might be able to see our enemy coming. Sleep that night was fitful and riddled with nightmares. Every groan of a tree branch had me snapping awake, gun raised, expecting to see glowing eyes in the darkness. Come morning, we were ragged, physically spent and emotionally frayed. But alive. The creature hadn't found us. Yet. We were less than half a day's journey from the extraction point when disaster struck. We were traversing a narrow ridgeline, dense forests closing in on both sides, when a growl like rolling thunder split the air. The creature crashed out of the trees above us, its massive weight cracking branches and sending showers of leaves fluttering as it landed directly in our path. Its yellow eyes were blazing now, fully awake and filled with a terrible, calculating hunger. And there was nothing wrong with it. No sign of the sedative. Walsh lied. Novak grunted, the pain making his voice rough. She never gave it anything. I didn't have time to process that betrayal. The creature surged towards us. It was even bigger now than the night before 
its muscles visibly bulging with grotesque power. We open fire, but our bullets seem to do little more than annoy it. In the chaos, I stumble backwards. I hit a tree root, and the world spun sickeningly. My gun skittered away, out of reach, as I watched in dawning horror as the creature bounded towards Novak and Ramirez. I heard their screams cut short, the wet cracking of bone, then silence. Blood splattered the forest floor, a grisly spray pattern painting the leaves. And then the creature was turning toward me, Dr. Walsh standing calmly beside it. This was always the plan, Alex, she said, her voice high and strained. A kind of manic energy gleamed in her eyes. Those men, expendable. Data collection. But you and this... She gestured to the creature. This is the breakthrough. It's beautiful, isn't it? The adaptability. The power. Rage coursed through me, a blinding, white-hot fury that banished the cold tendrils of terror. I lunged for my dropped sidearm, but the creature was faster. Its claws tore through my clothes and scraped across my chest. Pain slammed into me, and I cried out. Dr. Walsh laughed, the sound jarring against the stillness of the forest. See? she crowed. Progress, Alex. Incredible, unstoppable progress. The creature loomed over me. Its teeth were stained red with the blood of my friends. With the last of my strength, I kicked upwards, my desperate aim rewarded as my boots smashed into its snout and elicited a pained snarl. It stumbled back, opening a window of opportunity. I scrambled towards the extraction point, fueled by desperation and the sickening knowledge that Dr. Walsh's madness had already claimed Novak and Ramirez. It's a long way back to civilization even without a genetically warped behemoth on your tail. I don't know how I made it. They found me staggering on the roadside, incoherent, my clothes a mess of mud and blood. The agency debriefs were brutal. They didn't fully believe my story, blamed shock and trauma, but the bodies of Novak and Ramirez were proof enough that something monstrous had stalked us through those woods. Dr. Walsh was never found, and neither was that thing. Some nights I lie awake and think I hear the crunch of its footsteps under my window, the scraping of claws against stone. Maybe I'm paranoid, broken from what I saw that day. Or maybe there's truth to my nightmares. The Adirondacks still hold dark secrets, a primal evil unleashed by human arrogance. And I'm left haunted by the knowledge that it was one of our own who set those horrors free. My name's Marcus Pierce, and this happened to me back in September of 2011. Back then, I was running with a specialized CIA team, the sort they tapped for missions that blurred the line between military and science fiction. It was the sort of job where you never told your wife your real destination, and your family thought you worked in insurance or something equally boring. This particular assignment was weird from the start. Something about seismic sensors picking up unusual activity in a remote part of the Great Smoky Mountains. Locals whispered about strange disappearances, and the bigwigs were worried there could be some sort of secret paramilitary operation setting up shop on American soil. We went in expecting to find a rebel camp, not the nightmare we actually found. There were three of us, Torres, Jackson, and me. Torres was our tech specialist, the sort of quiet genius who could hack a satellite one minute, then crack a self-deprecating joke the next. Jackson was muscle with a heart of gold, a former marine with a grin that could make a nun blush. He called me Grandpa, since technically I was the oldest. 
We spent two weeks slogging through those hauntingly beautiful mountains. The air was thick with the smell of pine and damp undergrowth. It felt like there was something watching us, every snap of a twig setting us on edge. Torres kept picking up strange readings, but every time we closed in, it was like whatever we were tracking vanished into thin air. One evening, we set up camp near a shallow cave system. Jackson rigged the perimeter with trip wires and motion detectors, his usual meticulous routine. The rest of us were exhausted, but Torres couldn't leave the sensors alone. He kept muttering about energy spikes that didn't make any sense. Torres enough, I finally told him. We'll check it out in the morning, get some sleep. The next thing I remember is the earth shaking and a cacophony of noise that shredded the night's quiet. Tree branches cracked, rocks tumbled down the slope. Jackson yelled something before it all drowned out in a sound like the world splitting open. I scrambled for my rifle, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. Jackson was shouting, grabbing his own gear. Torres fumbled with his equipment. The sensors, they're going haywire. Before we could react, the top half of a fallen tree crashed through the mouth of the cave. Dust choked the air, and something lumbered out of the shadows. It stood at least nine feet tall, its form both monstrous and oddly human. Its skin had a rough, mottled texture, mottled in shades of brown and gray like old tree bark. Its legs were impossibly long and powerful, its arms ending in vicious black claws. The thing's eyes burned like embers in its craggy, almost skeletal head. We froze in sheer shock. This wasn't a rebel or a guy in a suit. This was a nightmare ripped from the darkest corner of the forest. It let out a screech that shook the cave, a deafening mixture of animal roar and something else. Then it charged. I opened fire, the gun bucking in my hands. Torres and Jackson joined in, a deafening barrage of bullets echoing through the confined space. The creature staggered under the onslaught but didn't go down. It ripped one of Jackson's motion sensors free with a swipe of its claws, the metal twisting like a paper clip. Jackson, move! Torres yelled. Jackson scrambled back, but too slow. The creature lunged for him, its massive jaws snapping shut inches from his face. Jackson brought up his rifle and fired point-blank into the creature's chest. Blood splattered, dark and thick, and the thing roared in pain. But it wasn't enough. With sickening speed, the creature swiped its claws across Jackson's midsection. He let out a strangled cry, dropping his rifle and crumpling to the ground. The creature moved to finish him. No! I roared and charged at the beast, slamming the butt of my rifle into its head. It reeled back, momentarily disoriented. Torres seized the chance, sprinting past and dragging Jackson further into the cave. I followed, firing backwards to buy them time. The creature turned its blazing eyes on me. It lunged, and I barely dodged, rolling to the side as a shower of dirt and rock exploded where I'd been standing. The cave narrowed behind me. Panic prickled at the back of my neck. There was no escape route. We were backed into a corner. Up ahead, I could hear Torres grunting with the effort of moving Jackson, the sounds echoing back ominously. Leave him! I shouted, my voice ragged. We wouldn't all make it out of this. Like hell I will! Torres' voice cracked with grief and defiance. The creature stalked towards us, a horrifying picture of unnatural resilience against our onslaught. Its chest wound was bad, but it wasn't slowing down. Each ragged breath it took whistled through the bloody gash a gruesome soundtrack to our impending doom. My rifle clicked empty. Desperate, I drew my sidearm. A few more shots, maybe I could at least slow the damn thing down. 
I emptied my remaining bullets into the creature with grim determination. It roared, staggering but relentless. Torres shouted in the distance, maybe a plea, maybe a curse. Every cell in my body screamed at me to run, but my feet felt rooted to the spot. Then, a flicker of movement in the cave's depths. Torres emerged, a look of terrible resolve on his face. In his hand was a bundle of something that glowed with a strange, pulsing light. Thermobaric grenades, Torres gasped, his voice tight with the effort of dragging them. I rigged them with a remote trigger, figure we go out with a bang. It was madness, desperation, and probably the only chance we had left. Cover me! I yelled, lunging forward. The creature, distracted by Torres' sudden reappearance, roared in fury. My shoulders and elbows connected with its side, a jarring, bone-bruising impact. I'd barely managed to force it to turn, opening up a narrow corridor to where Torres had dragged Jackson further back into the cave. Then I turned and ran. Behind me, I heard the creature's bellow of rage, Torres' frantic shouts, the heavy thump of Jackson's wounded body being dragged with grim determination. It felt like forever before I reached Torres. Jackson lay on the damp ground, his face pale. With trembling hands, Torres pushed the detonator into my grip. We clear? He gasped. Clear? I choked, giving him a twisted, bitter grin. The creature had nearly reached us, a grotesque silhouette against the dwindling light of the cave entrance. It howled in primal fury, a sound that crawled under my skin, the promise of a violent end. I thumbed the detonator. One press, and we'd all vanish in a blinding flash. At least the mission would be a success, in the twisted calculus of our shadowed world. Goodbye, my friend, Torres whispered, giving a shaky salute that tore at my already frayed composure. The creature was lunging for us. I squeezed my eyes shut, finger tightening on the trigger. In my mind I saw my wife's smile, heard my kids' laughter, images of a life forever out of reach. A flicker of regret tightened my chest, but it was snuffed out by the hot wash of adrenaline and duty. Then a strange noise, like the rustling of countless dry leaves, filled the cave. I opened my eyes. The creature had frozen mid-stride. Its burning eyes widened, not with rage, but with a chilling flicker of confusion. The ground beneath it seemed to writhe, long, sinuous shapes bursting from the cracked stone and coiling around it with impossible speed. They were like vines, but a sickly, pale color, pulsing with a strange inner light. The creature thrashed, its roars turning into high-pitched screeches of agony as the tendrils tightened, squeezing the life from its monstrous form. I could only watch, dumbstruck. Torres slumped beside me, his mouth working soundlessly, eyes wide with a mix of horror and fascination. Then, as quickly as they had appeared, the pale vines began to melt away, oozing back into the ground like a grotesque, retreating tide. The creature collapsed with a final, shuddering thud, its eyes dimming, its body left a mangled, inert heap. Silence descended, broken only by the ragged sound of our own breathing. Jackson, still unconscious, groaned in pain. Shaking, I knelt beside him and checked for a pulse. It was weak but steady. He'd live. The cave stank of the creature's thick blood and something else, an acrid, earthy odor that made my stomach churn. Torres crept toward the creature's body, moving with the cautious precision of a scientist confronted by the unknown. He reached down, a gloved hand dipping into the black pool of blood, then recoiled with a hiss, shaking his fingers as if scalded. It burns, he said, a tremor in his voice. Whatever that thing was, it's not natural. 
We carried Jackson out of the cave just as dawn painted the sky in streaks of gray and pink. The cool morning air was a relief after the close, blood-soaked air of the underground. We collapsed near a mossy boulder, exhausted and shaken. Questions swirled in my head, a storm of confusion fueled by adrenaline and the lingering fear of that monstrous creature. The retrieval team arrived a few hours later, drawn by our emergency signal, armed for a bear or some crazed militia. What they found was a cave splattered with blood, the creature's mangled carcass, and three hollow-eyed survivors trying to process the impossible. The aftermath as always, was the messy part. Debriefings, evaluations, and the piercing silences from the brass that spoke volumes. Torres tried to explain about the creature, but they dismissed him. Wild animal attack fueled by shock, they said. They patched me up, pronounced me fit for duty, and shoved the whole incident under a bureaucratic rug labeled classified. Some time later, I found Torres at a bar we used to frequent after particularly rough missions. He didn't even need to say anything. He ordered me a shot, something strong that burned on the way down, and we just sat together in the dim light. I keep seeing it, Torres said finally, staring into his glass. The way it moved those eyes. Yeah, me too. Jackson too. My voice trailed off. There was nothing to be said, really. I never went back to the CIA. I drifted for a while, taking odd jobs here and there. Haunted. Each creak of a floorboard, every flicker of shadow, brings it back. The Great Smoky Mountains, a place of terrible beauty. Jackson's laugh and Torah's quiet brilliance, lost forever within its depths. And always, the creature, its yellow eyes blazing in the darkness, a stark reminder that some battles can't be won, some things can't be unseen. Nights are the worst. I dream of that cave. I dream of the impossible pale vines, a deeper, more ancient form of life hidden beneath the earth. And I always wake wondering, with a cold dread settling deep in my bones, did they truly kill the creature? Or did they only drive it deeper back into whatever abyss it crawled from? My name's Grant Miller, and this whole mess happened back in November 2008. Back then, I was running with a specialized unit within the CIA handling jobs that were equal parts dangerous and bizarre. Think less James Bond, more X-Files. We were the guys they called when things got weird. Like most people in this line of work, I can't tell my wife the details, the half-truths of business trips, long ago becoming as familiar as breathing. The assignment seemed simple on the surface— investigate unusual wildlife sightings in a remote section of Yellowstone National Park. We thought it was probably some rancher's experiment gone wrong or a hoax to drum up tourism. What we encountered in those woods was, let's just say bears and mountain lions are the least scary things lurking in the American wilderness. Our team was four strong me, Nguyen, Carter, and Brooks. Nguyen was our tech expert, the kind of guy who could hack a UFO if he had to. Carter was the muscle, ex-military with a deadpan sense of humor that would have been funny if we weren't constantly on the brink of getting torn limb from limb. Brooks was our wildlife specialist, and probably the sanest one of the bunch. We set out into the park in early autumn. Yellowstone's a breathtaking place, the kind that reminds you how small a person is in the grand scheme of things. But there was unease in the air, a prickling at the back of my neck that told me those woods weren't as pristine as they seemed. The first few days were mostly about tracking. We found enormous, clawed footprints that didn't match any known animal. Brooks nearly fainted when he found Scott the size of a basketball, 
and one's equipment picked up strange energy readings he swore shouldn't be possible. But the creature itself stayed elusive. We built camp in a clearing near a stream. It felt more exposed than usual, but it was the best we could find given the terrain. Carter rigged the perimeter with infrared sensors, his gruff voice cutting through the silent forest. Think those little wires are gonna stop whatever made those tracks? I asked him, only half joking. He shrugged, his face unreadable in the twilight. Gives us a warning at least. Night fell quickly, and with it came an unnerving silence. No rustling leaves or animal calls, just this oppressive stillness. Nguyen spent the evening hunched over his laptop, muttering about corrupted data and impossible frequencies. Sleep was fitful. I woke with a start, a sense of wrongness hanging heavy in the air. It wasn't a sound that woke me, but the absence of it. Suddenly, an air-splitting screech tore through the night. It was high-pitched, filled with fury, and unlike anything I'd ever heard. Carter's perimeter alarms went haywire, flashing madly in the darkness. We got movement, multiple targets, big! His voice was a tense whisper through the comms. I grabbed my rifle and scrambled out of the tent. The others weren't far behind, their faces pale in the beams of our flashlights. Out there, just at the edge of the light, multiple pairs of eyes shone at us, brilliant, predatory yellow. Then the creatures stepped out of the darkness. Each one was a monstrosity. They stood at least seven feet tall, their bodies covered in thick, matted fur that looked like it could turn aside bullets. But the worst was their heads. Muzzles stretched out into wolf-like snouts filled with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Their eyes burned with that impossible yellow light, filled with a chilling intelligence. We opened fire, the gunshots shattering the silent forest. The creatures shrieked in rage and charged. Nguyen went down first. One of the monsters lunged for him, its wickedly curved claws ripping through his Kevlar vest, spraying gore across the damp earth. He barely had time to scream. Carter roared and unleashed a fresh volley of gunfire, driving several of the creatures back. He grabbed Nguyen's radio, his voice shaking. We need backup now. I repeat, we... A terrifying blur of movement, and Carter was gone. Snatched from the ground so fast I barely registered it. All that remained was his gun, lying forgotten in the grass. Brooks and I were back to back, spraying desperate shots into the darkness. One of the creatures went down, a thick black ichor oozing from a chest wound, but there were still at least three of them. They were toying with us, enjoying the hunt. Brooks let out a strangled cry as one of the monsters circled behind him. Before I could react it lunged, its immense jaws clamping around his leg. He screamed in agony, firing blindly into the creature, but it dragged him bodily into the trees. His gunshots rang out, then were abruptly, chillingly cut off. I was alone. Panic was a jagged shard of ice in my veins, but I forced it down. There was no time for fear. The smell of blood hung thick in the air, Nguyen's, Carter's, Brooks. It was the smell of death. And those monstrous eyes were still there in the shadows, watching, calculating. I stumbled backwards, desperately trying to reload as the creatures advanced. Somewhere in the back of my mind, a voice was screaming about protocol, about securing evidence, but all I could think about was survival. Then I tripped over a tree root and tumbled to the ground, my rifle clattering away out of reach. I scrambled back, fumbling blindly in my pack for my backup sidearm. My fingers brushed against the cold metal of the pistol just as a monstrous form leaped towards me. I squeezed the trigger again and again, the roar of gunfire deafening in the sudden stillness. 
the creature reared up, its guttural shriek cutting through the night. Dark blood splattered the ground, and it collapsed with a final, shuddering spasm. My hands shook as I struggled to my feet. But there were still two of them out there. I knew even then that I wasn't going to make it off that mountain. It was just a matter of how long I could hold them off. I wasn't going down without a fight. I fumbled for something, anything in my bag that might give me an edge. My hand closed around a flare. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. With shaking fingers, I struck the flare and hurled it towards the remaining creatures. It landed at their feet, hissing and sparking, casting garish red light across their monstrous forms. They backed away, snarling in confusion. Fire, primal and unpredictable. Maybe it spooked them. I took my chance, sprinting through the trees, ignoring the stabbing pain in my side from my earlier fall. I had no idea where I was going, but anywhere had to be better than that clearing. The creatures roared in anger behind me, but they didn't pursue, at least not immediately. I ran until my lungs felt like they were going to burst. Branches tore at my face and the ground was uneven, but I didn't dare stop. Finally, gasping for breath, I collapsed behind a fallen log, the pulse pounding in my ears so loud I could barely hear the creatures crashing through the woods in my wake. How long they searched for me, I don't know. After a while, blessed silence descended. I lay there, my body throbbing, waiting for the inevitable, but the attack never came. Perhaps they had given up, or were waiting for daylight. Either way, it bought me some time. As dawn broke, I pushed myself up and started moving again, stumbling through the dense undergrowth. I had no destination in mind, only the blind instinct to put as much distance as possible between myself and that blood-soaked clearing. By some miracle, I found a ranger station later that day. It was deserted, the radio equipment dead. I managed to patch my wounds and send out a garbled distress signal on the emergency broadcast band. Rescue arrived two days later. My wild story of monsters in the woods was met with skepticism, with thinly veiled assumptions of shock-induced delusions. It took weeks of debriefings and psych evaluations before the brass was satisfied I would keep my mouth shut and fall in line. The aftermath is a blur. There were cover stories, hushed whispers about rogue bear attacks, and missing persons reports quietly buried in park archives. No evidence of the creatures was ever found. My team was declared officially dead, their names added to a memorial somewhere in Langley that they don't make a big show about to the public. I never went back to the CIA. I left that life behind and tried to bury the memory of that night deep within me. You can go ahead and call me crazy, call me traumatized. I won't argue with you. Sometimes, late at night, I see those yellow eyes in the darkness and hear Nguyen's scream echoing through the trees. Most days, I manage to convince myself it was a nightmare, a hallucination born from exhaustion and terror. I tell myself that those creatures couldn't possibly be real, that the rational world I cling to hasn't devolved entirely into chaos. But on some nights... When the wind whispers through the trees outside my window, sounding eerily like a deathly screech, I start to doubt my own sanity. Because I know what I saw out there, what tore my team apart. And in the deepest hours of the night, a terrifying truth remains. We were the lucky ones that day. If those creatures were smart enough to toy with us, to hunt us for sport, who knows how many others they took? There's a darkness in those woods, a primal, ancient hunger. And the most horrifying thought of all is this, perhaps, even now, they're still out there, waiting, watching, and biding their time. We think we're the ones in control, the apex predators of this planet. 
But sometimes, at night, I get the chilling feeling that we're not at the top of the food chain at all. That in the vast, uncharted corners of this world, true monsters might be lurking creatures beyond our comprehension, for whom we are nothing more than prey. And with every creak of a floorboard, every flicker of shadow, the fear claws at me that some day they might come calling again. My name's Alex Tanner, and the mess I'm about to tell you about happened back in August of 2014. I'm a field operative for the CIA, the kind of guy sent in when things go sideways. The weirder the circumstances, the better suited I am for the job. I've been a lot of places, seen a lot of things, but nothing prepared me for the Adirondack Mountains. I'd like to tell my wife these stories someday, maybe when she thinks I've finally gone soft, tell her all about the shadows that lurk in the American wilderness. For now, it's just another mission coded, encrypted, the truth buried under layers of red tape. We were tracking some chatter about a rogue paramilitary group experimenting with genetic modification, supposedly messing around with animal DNA to create something off the books. My team was two other seasoned CIA agents, Novak and Ramirez, and a biologist, Dr. Walsh. We always brought a specialist along for jobs like these. Novak was ex-army rangers, built like a bear with nerves of steel. Ramirez, our tech specialist, was always cracking terrible jokes to lighten the mood. Dr. Walsh, though brilliant, was maybe the least outdoors a person you could imagine. Didn't stop her from complaining about how primitive our camp setup was. The Adirondacks are beautiful, but in an untamed, primal sort of way, thick with ancient forest and crisscrossed by old logging trails. We were deep in, miles from the nearest sign of civilization. The local rumors were pretty outlandish something huge, with glowing eyes, attacking hikers and vanishing without a trace. I figured it was probably a bear, maybe infected with rabies, but orders were orders. We spent two weeks hunting for any sign of the supposed facility. Nights were chilly, the ground hard, and our packs were getting lighter. Morale was slipping, and even I was starting to think this was a wild goose chase. Then came the fourth night. I woke to a sound like someone dragging a wet sack of meat across the forest floor. I nudged Novak awake, and we listened in the pitch-black silence. Then we heard it again, a deep, scraping, snuffling sound that sent shivers down my spine. We woke Ramirez and Dr. Walsh, trying to stay quiet, but it didn't matter. The thing knew we were there. I flipped on my night vision. The world outside our tents was washed in shades of eerie green. Novak whispered for Dr. Walsh to stay close. The clearing was dead silent except for our own ragged breathing. And then it charged. The creature burst from the shadows, an unholy fusion of animal and nightmare. It was massive, twice the size of any bear, moving with unnatural speed and ferocity. Its eyes gleamed in the night vision like hot coals. It was all muscle and teeth, a patchwork chimera of coarse fur, ragged claws, and raw, pulsing sinew. The stench of it, rotting meat and something sulfurous, made me gag. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the night, but the creature barely flinched. It slammed into Novak, sending him sprawling, his gun flying from his hand. Novak screamed as the creature raked its claws across his back, tearing his pack open like it weighed nothing. Ramirez grabbed Dr. Walsh and bolted into the woods. Through the chaos, I caught a glimpse of the doctor fumbling with her pack, pulling out a syringe. It's a sedative, she yelled over the beast's screeches. Just distract it. 
I fired another volley into the creature, more to buy them time than inflict any real harm. It roared and spun, giving chase to Ramirez and Dr. Walsh. I took the chance, sprinting across the clearing towards Novak, who was slumped against the tree. As I reached Novak, I realized there was a gaping wound across his back, his blood seeping into the moss. I tried to stop the bleeding as best I could, but he kept choking, gasping out ragged breaths. Then his eyes rolled back into his head, and he was gone. The creature was gaining, closing the distance with disturbing speed. Ramirez tossed a flare behind it, a burst of bright red light in the sea of night vision green. The creature paused, confused, and Dr. Walsh seized the moment. She ran in with surprising agility, burying the syringe in the monster's thick hide. The effect was almost immediate. It faltered, let out a shuddering, strangled cry, then lumbered a few more steps before collapsing into the undergrowth. I turned back to Novak with a flicker of hope. Maybe he was just unconscious, maybe there was still time, but a glance at his still form confirmed the gut-wrenching truth. The light was gone from his eyes. Rage surged through me, a blinding, white-hot fury that banished the cold tendrils of terror. I didn't stop to think, just sprinted over towards Ramirez and Dr. Walsh. They were standing over the downed creature, Dr. Walsh scribbling furiously into a notebook with the single-minded intensity of a scientist confronted with the unimaginable. Ramirez saw me coming and shook his head. He's gone, man, he said, his voice thick with grief and a tremor I couldn't blame him for. That thing, it ripped him open. I wanted to scream, to lash out at the monster, at the damned woods, at the whole cruel, senseless situation. Instead, I stood rigid, my hands clenched into fists at my sides, my breasts harsh and ragged in the night. Can you, can you make contact with base? I asked, forcing a semblance of control into my voice. We need backup, a chopper. Ramirez shook his head again, looking grim. Tried the second it went down. Calms are scrambled, no signal. We're on our own out here. That single sentence was the nail in the coffin for any shred of normalcy. We were isolated, cut off and at the mercy of whatever that thing was. And there was Dr. Walsh, oblivious to the danger we were still in, practically drooling over the creature like it was a prized specimen. What the hell are you doing? I snarled at her, snatching the notebook from her grasp. She blinked in surprise, then her jaw set in a stubborn line. Documenting. This is a groundbreaking discovery. Think of the possibilities, possibilities. Lady, we just lost a teammate. That thing out there is a goddamn killing machine. She scoffed, then gestured dismissively towards the creature's prone form. Clearly it's vulnerable. The sedative worked. It was madness. This woman, she was so wrapped up in her work she couldn't see the forest for the trees or the blood dripping from the claws of the monster she was so keen to study. But without backup, we needed her. And maybe, I hated to admit, with the creature still sedated, she did have a point. Fine, I gritted out. But we're doing this my way. Prioritize our safety and getting the hell out of here. Dr. Walsh, though clearly disgruntled, didn't argue further. We took tissue samples and whatever data we could gather from the creature quickly and efficiently. I kept glancing back into the dark woods, the hair on the back of my neck prickling constantly. Even sedated, the thing radiated menace. By the time the first rays of dawn painted the sky gray, we'd done what we could. I used the satellite phone to send a coded distress signal, knowing it was a long shot but hoping the distortion wouldn't render it completely useless. Now what? Ramirez asked, 
voicing the question hanging heavy in the air between us. Do we wait for it to wake up, or... No, I said, my mind already working. We couldn't stay, but we also couldn't leave that thing alive. We set a trap. Use the rest of the sedative, lure it to the clearing, and torch the whole damn forest if we have to. We worked fast. Dr. Walsh, with some coaxing, concocted a potent cocktail using high-proof liquor from our supplies and the remaining sedative. We baited the clearing, the smell of alcohol sharp and strange in the crisp morning air. Then we rigged the place with tripwires and incendiaries. All the while, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were digging our own graves. By the time we were done, the sun was higher in the sky. The creature still hadn't stirred. But it would. And when it did, the ensuing fight would be a desperate bid for survival, with slim odds stacked against us. We waited, hunkered down out of sight, the tension a razor wire strung between us. It felt like forever, but it was only hours before the first twig snapped in the distance. I exchanged grim glances with Ramirez and Dr. Walsh, our weapons raised. I made a mental note it had been Walsh who named this clearing Ground Zero. It felt morbidly appropriate now. The creature appeared at the edge of the clearing, moving tentatively at first. It sniffed the air, a low growl rumbling in its chest. Then, its burning yellow eyes fixed on the bait, and it lunged with terrifying speed. The makeshift trap worked perfectly. As the creature hit the tripwire, the incendiaries triggered, showering the clearing in flames. The heat was instant, the roar of the fire deafening. The creature thrashed and bellowed, a monstrous silhouette contorted in agony against the inferno we'd created. I didn't look away. Witnessing the demise of this bioengineered abomination was the only form of closure I could hope for out here. Novak deserved that much. Hours later, the flames died down, leaving the clearing a charred wasteland. Of the creature, only ash and blackened bone remained. Ramirez and I collected what was left, securing it for transport, doing our best to follow protocol for what, we all knew, was fundamentally beyond protocol. Rescue arrived a day later, drawn feebly to our coded distress signal. They swarmed the site, the suits and clean-up crew a stark contrast to the horror we'd endured. I stood by stoically as Dr. Walsh was pulled aside for questioning, knowing they'd get no clear answers about what really happened out there. My report would be classified, sanitized. Novak's death became another sad statistic buried within Langley's walls. The aftermath is a blur. Debriefings, evaluations, the same damn questions twisted and rephrased until they were meaningless. They poked and prodded, searching for cracks in my psyche. I kept my mouth shut about the true nature of the thing we'd faced, following the unspoken rules of the game. Better a hero with a touch of shell shock than a lunatic ranting about monsters made in a lab. They sent me home on leave, said to take some time. But home isn't a haven anymore. At night, the Adirondacks invade my dreams, the ancient trees, the glowing eyes in the dark, and the ever-present echo of Novak's final scream. Some wounds never truly heal. And there's always that prickling dread— Maybe they didn't get everything out of those woods. Maybe there were more experiments, more creatures made and let loose in the world, waiting for a hiker, a camper, a team of unsuspecting CIA agents to cross their path. My name's Marcus Pierce. And this happened to me back in September of 2011. Back then, I was running with a specialized CIA team, the sort they tapped for missions that blurred the line between military and science fiction. 
It makes for a hell of a story over drinks if you live to tell it. But at the time, it mostly means sleepless nights and a creeping suspicion that the world's a lot less straightforward than the average Joe believes. This particular assignment started with whispers of unusual seismic activity in the Great Smoky Mountains. Locals were spooked, talking about park rangers going missing, and higher-ups were getting antsy about the possibility of some foreign power setting up a secret base. We were flown out under cover of darkness, ready to find a bunker or a missile silo or something similarly human. What we ended up tracking down was a nightmare ripped straight from a B-movie. Our team was four strong me, Torres, Jackson, and Brooks. Torres was our tech wizard, the kind of guy who could hack into a satellite from his laptop. Jackson was all southern charm and ex-marine muscle, could crack a bad joke and a skull with equal ease. Brooks was the wildlife expert, a walking encyclopedia of Smoky Mountains fauna, and about as excitable as a tree stump. The first few days were mostly about recon. The Smokies are beautiful, a dense tangle of ancient forests and misshrouded peaks. But the park felt off, a hush hanging heavy in the air despite the usual bird calls and rustle of leaves. Found plenty of animal tracks, but they seemed to vanish into thin air as we followed them deeper into the woods. Brooks kept talking about impossible sightings, but I chalked it up to nerves until the night it happened. We set up camp in a hollow, trying to blend in, keeping the comms chatter to a minimum. Sleep was hard to come by, the primeval quiet of the forest stirring a primal unease deep within me. Then, abruptly, the ground started shaking. No earthquake rumble, this was different rhythmic, heavy thuds that shook the leaves from the trees and sent a panicked flock of birds screeching into the night sky. Torres was frantically scanning his instruments. Whatever's causing this, it's big. And it's close. We scrambled out of the tents, weapons drawn, lights scanning the tree line. That's when we saw them, glowing eyes, a pair of them like burning embers, low to the ground at the edge of the darkness. Then another pair. And another. The creatures stepped into the dim ring of our flashlights. I'd seen some messed up things in my time, but nothing prepared me for this. They were at least seven feet tall, their bodies hulking masses of muscle and matted fur. Their snouts were elongated, wolf-like but stretched and grotesque. Claws like steak knives tipped their paws and their eyes. I keep seeing those yellow eyes, filled with a chilling intelligence that made my blood run cold. What the hell are those things? Jackson breathed, his usual grin replaced by a pale mask of fear. Nobody answered. Nobody had an answer. Then the creatures charged. We opened fire, bullets ripping into the night air. Torres swore, his usual stream of tech commentary replaced with short, terrified gasps. I saw one creature go down, its body shuddering under the impact, but the rest kept coming. They weren't just big or fast, they were smart, slinking through the trees to flank us, their movements eerily coordinated. Brooks was screaming. I spun, just in time to see a monstrous shape hurtle out of the darkness, tackling him to the ground. The gunfire stopped abruptly, the sickening crunch of bone and wet, tearing sounds replacing it. Brooks! Jackson roared, grief and rage in his voice as he fired wildly towards the attacker. He didn't stand a chance. One of the creatures flanked him, lightning fast. A blur of claws, a spray of blood and Jackson's scream cut short. Fall back! I yelled at Torres, who was already scrambling back towards the tree line. I didn't know where the hell we could go but staying there was a death sentence. I sprinted after him, firing blindly over my shoulder to buy some time, the smell of copper and the taste of bile in my throat. We crashed through the undergrowth, 
branches whipping our faces, the creatures hot on our heels. Torres was shouting incoherently, his hands shaking so badly I was afraid he'd lose his grip on his rifle. The Smokies at night were a maze of shadows and tangled roots, every fallen log, every deceptive twist of the trail a potential death trap. I tripped, sprawling to the ground, the force of the impact knocking the breath from my lungs. A flurry of movement, and one of the creatures was upon me. I rolled desperately, its claws tearing gashes in my pack and narrowly missing my skin. Scrambling up, I blindly fired a shot. Luck or pure adrenaline, I couldn't be sure, but it seemed to connect. The creature let out a roar, more of fury than pain, and retreated momentarily. Torres! Where the hell are we going? I yelled, fear and frustration warring within me trying to find a way to confuse the signal. He was crouched behind a moss-covered boulder, frantically typing on his laptop. Confuse what signal? What are you talking about? His fingers stilled. They, their eyes, they seem to react to our comms, he said, his voice trembling. Maybe if I can scramble the frequency, disrupt, distract them. It was crazy a long shot at best. But we were out of options. Do it! I barked, scrambling to cover him. Torres started tapping in commands with the frenzied focus of a desperate man. As he worked, the creatures began to circle us, their glowing eyes narrowing in the pitch blackness. One of them let out a low growl, the sound vibrating chillingly through the night. It was sizing us up, deciding who would be the first course of its gruesome feast. Almost there. Torres muttered, sweat beating on his forehead. I fired off a few shots, not to injure, but to keep them at bay. The bullets seemed to irritate the creatures more than anything, but it bought us some precious time. Got it! Torres yelled in triumph. He hit a final key, then the screen on the laptop flickered displaying a chaotic tangle of waveforms and flashing code. The effect was almost instantaneous. The creatures paused, their heads tilting sideways in what could have been surprise or confusion. Seizing the moment, I hauled Torres to his feet and yelled with what felt like my last bit of strength. Run! We ran like hell had opened up and was spitting those monsters right at our heels. I knew they'd break through the scrambling soon enough. Whatever Torres had rigged up, it was just a flimsy digital wall against the raw, predatory power of those things. My lungs burned. My legs felt like two slabs of lead. And through it all, there was the thudding of clawed feet behind us, getting closer. Desperate, I searched the murky forest for anything that might give us an edge. That's when I saw it, a sheer cliff face, dropping away into an abyss. It was risky, a hell of a long fall, probably deadly. But less deadly than what was chasing us. This way! I veered sharply, dragging a bewildered Torres with me. Reaching the cliff edge, I didn't hesitate. Trusting that there was something other than jagged rocks at the bottom, I jumped. Torres screamed whether in defiance or terror I couldn't tell. Then the world tilted, and we were falling, the wind screaming in our ears. Branches lashed at us, tearing gashes in my exposed skin. I hit the ground in a jarring impact that rattled my teeth, the breath knocked clean out of me. I could hear the monstrous creatures snarling at the edge of the cliff, sensing our escape but unwilling or unable to pursue. Groaning, I rolled over. Miraculously, I was alive. Torres landed beside me a moment later, a jumble of limbs and ragged curses, but alive. Morning light was just starting to filter through the trees when we managed to stumble out of the woods. We were battered, bruised, and bleeding, but we had somehow survived the night. Search and rescue found us a few hours later, 
drawn by our emergency beacon. The aftermath was the usual mess. Debriefings, medical exams, and those piercing silences from the brass that screamed of cover-ups and sanitized reports. They wanted to know what we'd encountered in those woods, but not really. What they really wanted was plausible deniability, a neat explanation to tuck away in some classified file, far removed from the reality of what had truly stalked us in the ancient heart of the Smokies. Brooks and Jackson wouldn't get neat explanations. They'd get closed caskets and military honors, their names spoken in hushed tones over whiskey in some Langley backroom. Their gruesome deaths became another grim statistic, another sacrifice on the shadowy altar of national security. As for me, they offered a transfer, some desk job pushing paper in a windowless office. I turned it down. I never went back to the CIA, to that world of hidden truths and blood-soaked secrets. Some nights I dream of the great smoky mountains, of the forest floor carpeted in moonlight, and the gleam of yellow eyes in the dark. I dream of claws and teeth, and the choked-off screams of my friends. Mostly, I dream of Torres and his frantic scramble to jam the signal. He was right, you see. Somehow, those creatures were tied to our tech. Maybe we lured them there. Maybe they were waiting all along. It makes me wonder what else is lurking out there, unseen and unknown, in the vast, wild places beyond the reach of our satellites and scrambling codes. Something old and hungry and far more cunning than we like to imagine. Maybe Torres was on to something. Or maybe, in saving our lives, he opened a door that was better left firmly shut. My name's Grant Miller, and this whole mess happened back in November 2008. Back then, I was running with a specialized unit within the CIA, handling jobs that were equal parts dangerous and bizarre. Think less James Bond, more X-Files. We were the guys that get called when things got weird. My wife calls me a workaholic. Maybe she's right, but this job... It pulls you in. The world seems a little darker, a little more dangerous, once you've stared into the abyss behind the everyday. It leaves you wanting to be out there, making a difference, even when you know the difference might cost you everything. The assignment seemed simple on the surface. Investigate unusual wildlife sightings in a remote section of Yellowstone National Park. We thought it was probably some rancher's experiment gone wrong or a hoax to drum up tourism. What we encountered in those woods was, let's just say bears and mountain lions are the least scary things lurking in the American wilderness. Our team was four strong me, Nguyen, Carter, and Brooks. Nguyen was our tech expert, the kind of guy who could hack a UFO if he had to. Carter was the muscle ex-military with a deadpan sense of humor that would have been funny if we weren't constantly on the brink of getting torn apart limb from limb. Brooks was our wildlife specialist, and probably the sanest one of the bunch. We set out into the park in early autumn. Yellowstone's a breathtaking place, the kind that reminds you how small a person is in the grand scheme of things. But there was unease in the air a prickling at the back of my neck that told me those woods weren't as pristine as they seemed. The first few days were mostly about tracking. We found enormous, clawed footprints that didn't match any known animal. Brooks nearly fainted when he found Scott the size of a basketball, and one's equipment picked up strange energy readings he swore shouldn't be possible. But the creature itself stayed elusive. We built camp in a clearing near a stream. It felt more exposed than usual, but it was the best we could find given the terrain. Carter rigged the perimeter with infrared sensors, his gruff voice cutting through the silent forest. 
think those little wires are gonna stop whatever made those tracks. I asked him, only half joking. He shrugged, his face unreadable in the twilight. Gives us a warning at least. Night fell quickly, and with it came an unnerving silence. No rustling leaves or animal calls, just an oppressive stillness. Nguyen spent the evening hunched over his laptop, muttering about corrupted data and impossible frequencies. Sleep was fitful. I woke with a start, a sense of wrongness hanging heavy in the air. It wasn't a sound that woke me, but the absence of it. Suddenly, an ear-splitting screech tore through the night. It was high-pitched, filled with fury, and unlike anything I'd ever heard. Carter's perimeter alarms went haywire, flashing madly in the darkness. We got movement, multiple targets, big! His voice was a tense whisper through the comms. I grabbed my rifle and scrambled out of the tent. The others weren't far behind, their faces pale in the beams of our flashlights. Out there, just at the edge of the light, multiple pairs of eyes shone at us, brilliant, predatory yellow. Then the creatures stepped out of the darkness. Each one was a monstrosity. They stood at least seven feet tall, their bodies covered in thick matted fur that looked like it could turn aside bullets. But the worst was their heads. Muzzles stretched out into wolf-like snouts filled with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Their eyes burned with that impossible yellow light, filled with a chilling intelligence. We opened fire, the gunshots shattering the silent forest. The creatures shrieked in rage and charged. Nguyen went down first. One of the monsters lunged for him, its wickedly curved claws ripping through his Kevlar vest, spraying gore across the damp earth. He barely had time to scream. Carter roared and unleashed a fresh volley of gunfire, driving several of the creatures back. He grabbed Nguyen's radio, his voice shaking. We need backup now. I repeat, we. A terrifying blur of movement, and Carter was gone. Snatched from the ground so fast I barely registered it. All that remained was his gun, lying forgotten in the grass. Brooks and I were back to back, spraying desperate shots into the darkness. One of the creatures went down, a thick black ichor oozing from a chest wound, but there were still at least three of them. They were toying with us, enjoying the hunt. Brooks let out a strangled cry as one of the monsters circled behind him. Before I could react it lunged, its immense jaws clamping around his leg. He screamed in agony, firing blindly into the creature, but it dragged him bodily into the trees. His gunshots rang out, then were abruptly, chillingly cut short. I was alone. Panic was a jagged shard of ice in my veins, but I forced it down. There was no time for fear. The smell of blood hung thick in the air, Nguyen's, Carter's, Brooks. It was the smell of death. And those monstrous eyes were still there in the shadows, watching, calculating. Behind their terrifying forms, I could sense an almost playful malevolence, as if we were not prey, but mere entertainment for these nightmare hunters. I stumbled backwards, desperately trying to reload as the creatures advanced. Somewhere in the back of my mind, a voice was screaming about protocol, about securing evidence, but all I could think about was survival. Then I tripped over a tree root and tumbled to the ground, my rifle clattering away out of reach. I scrambled back, fumbling blindly in my pack for my backup sidearm. My fingers brushed against the cold metal of the pistol just as a monstrous form leaped towards me. I squeezed the trigger, again and again, the roar of gunfire deafening in the sudden stillness. The creature reared up its guttural shriek cutting through the night. Dark blood splattered the ground, and it collapsed with a final, shuddering spasm. My hands shook as I struggled to my feet. 
but there were still two of them out there. I knew even then that I wasn't going to make it off that mountain. It was just a matter of how long I could hold them off. I wasn't going down without a fight. I fumbled for something, anything in my bag that might give me an inch. My hand closed around a flare. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. With shaking fingers, I struck the flare and hurled it towards the remaining creatures. It landed at their feet, hissing and sparking, casting garish red light across their monstrous forms. They backed away, snarling in confusion. Fire, primal and unpredictable. Maybe it spooked them. I took my chance, sprinting through the trees, ignoring the stabbing pain in my side from my earlier fall. I had no idea where I was going, but anywhere had to be better than that clearing. The creatures roared in anger behind me, but they didn't pursue, at least not immediately. I ran until my lungs felt like they were going to burst. Branches tore at my face and the ground was uneven, but I didn't dare stop. Finally, gasping for breath, I collapsed behind a fallen log, the pulse pounding in my ears so loud I could barely hear the creatures crashing through the woods in my wake. How long they searched for me, I don't know. After a while, blessed silence descended. I lay there, my body throbbing, waiting for the inevitable, but the attack never came. Perhaps they had given up, or were waiting for daylight. Either way, it bought me some time. As dawn broke, I pushed myself up and started moving again, stumbling through the dense undergrowth. I had no destination in mind, only the blind instinct to put as much distance as possible between myself and that blood-soaked clearing. By some miracle, I found a ranger station later that day. It was deserted, the radio equipment dead. I managed to patch my wounds and send out a garbled distress signal on the emergency broadcast band. Rescue arrived two days later. My wild story of monsters in the woods was met with skepticism, with thinly veiled assumptions of shock-induced delusions. It took weeks of debriefings and psych evaluations before the brass was satisfied I would keep my mouth shut and fall in line. The aftermath is a blur. There were cover stories, hushed whispers about rogue bear attacks, and missing persons reports quietly buried in park archives. No evidence of the creatures was ever found. My team was declared officially dead, their names added to a memorial somewhere in Langley that they don't make a big show about to the public. I never went back to the CIA. I left that life behind and tried to bury the memory of that night deep within me. You can go ahead and call me crazy, call me traumatized. I won't argue with you. Sometimes, late at night, I see those yellow eyes in the darkness and hear Nguyen's scream echoing through the trees. Most days, I manage to convince myself it was a nightmare, a hallucination born from exhaustion and terror. I tell myself that those creatures couldn't possibly be real, that the rational world I cling to hasn't devolved entirely into chaos. But on some nights... When the wind whispers through the trees outside my window, sounding eerily like a deathly screech, I start to doubt my own sanity. Because I know what I saw out there, what tore my team apart. And in the deepest hours of the night, a terrifying truth remains. We were the lucky ones that day. If those creatures were smart enough to toy with us, to hunt us for sport, who knows how many others they took? There's a darkness in those woods, a primal, ancient hunger. And the most horrifying thought of all is this, perhaps, even now, they're still out there, waiting, watching, and biding their time. There might be others like them, lurking not just in the isolated corners of Yellowstone, but in the shadowy heart of any forest, any seemingly pristine wilderness. We think we're the ones in control, the apex predators of this planet. 
but the encounter in Yellowstone forever shattered that illusion for me. There's a chilling vulnerability to being human after all. Sometimes, at night, I get the feeling that we're not at the top of the food chain at all. That in the vast, uncharted corners of this world, we might just be the prey. And with every creak of a floorboard, every flicker of shadow, the fear claws at me that someday, they might come calling again. My name is Marcus Wilde, and this happened to me on October 12, 2021. I've worked in the CIA for almost two decades now. Most of that time was office drudgery. You know, the kind they show in movies, except without the exciting spy music and tailored Italian suits. I was always more of a paper pusher, an analyst. A few years ago, though, my division opened up a new department. Something different. They didn't explain much, just that I fit the profile. I figured, why not? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I never could have imagined where it would lead. Turns out the new gig involved investigating stuff the bigwigs deem. High strangeness. Sightings, encounters, disappearances, things that didn't make sense under the normal rules. My first assignment took me to the desolate backcountry of Nevada. The brief was thin. Something had been snatching hikers in the Ruby Mountains wilderness area. It left little mess, less evidence, and the disappearances baffled the local sheriff's department. They eventually roped in the park service but came up empty-handed. So, there I was, freshly minted X-Files agent, hiking the same trails as those who never returned. I carried a sidearm, of course, but was unsure what good it would do against, well, whatever was out there. The Ruby Mountains are stark, beautiful, and empty. I had hiked for four days without seeing another soul, despite it being peak fall foliage season. The leaves were fire, the silence oppressive, and gnawing unease ate at me. I spent my nights in one of the small fire watchtowers dotting the hills just in case whatever was out there was nocturnal. The afternoon of the fourth day, I found the first sign. It was a campsite, barely disturbed, yet clearly abandoned. Sleeping bag unrolled, gear neatly stacked, but no people. A chill went down my spine, this was too similar to the other disappearances. A glint of metal caught my eye, and I moved closer to a pile of equipment. It was a camera, its lens shattered as if by a precise blow. Shuffling through the contents of a bag, I found several rolls of developed film. In a move that felt lifted from a bad horror flick, I slotted a roll into the camera and held it up to the failing light. A series of unremarkable landscape photos flicked by. Then, something else. Blurry shapes moving through the trees at uncanny speed. Too tall, too long, and the next image was even worse. A lone hiker, back turned to the camera, unaware of the hulking, contorted figure leaping on him from the shadowed brush. My heart pounded. Dropping the camera... I instinctively reached for my sidearm. A deep guttural growl vibrated through the silence. It came from above me. I spun around. It was crouched on the fire tower's platform, silhouette hunched against the blood-red sunset. Its form was wrong. Twisted limbs, fingers far too long, and a head far too large for its slender body. Yellow eyes glittered in the fading light filled with malevolent intelligence. It lunged. I barely had time to raise my gun, firing wildly. The shots echoed through the mountains, but they didn't seem to stop it. Its unnatural agility was terrifying, like watching a spider in human-shaped dart and weave around my clumsy movements. The acrid smell of its breath filled my nostrils. As it closed in, 
I stumbled back against the railing of the tower. I was out of ammo. Fear jolted through me. My world narrowed down to its dripping jaws and the empty drop below me. In a split-second decision, I leaped backward, grasping the railing and letting myself fall into the twilight. There was the impact, the shock of cold water as I hit a deep creek bed far below, then scrambling and running downstream, driven by pure unthinking panic. I hid until morning, huddled under a rocky overhang. My ankle felt broken, every sound like the creature coming back for me. Finally, as the first rays of dawn painted the sky, I risked limping toward the nearest road, praying for a passing car. Luck was on my side. A ranger on patrol, shocked and concerned, found me a few hours later. I was in rough shape cut, bruised, hypothermic, and probably babbling about monsters. I was taken to a hospital, and my story was met with the predictable mix of skepticism and thinly veiled concern about my mental health. Officially, the incident was ruled a freak accident in the wilderness. My supervisors at the CIA were more understanding, or at least feigned it well. My shattered camera and the damaged roll of film somehow vanished from my hospital room and were never recovered. They reassigned me back to my old desk job, and I suspect the only reason I wasn't completely written off is I was always a by-the-books kind of guy. No one believes me, of course. It sounds insane, even to my own ears. But I know what I saw. The creature out there, whatever it is, is still roaming the wild places. The memory haunts me, and I'm filled with a terrible dread for anyone unlucky enough to cross its path.